uh, one of the things I was thinking about at lunchtime was the fact that there's a there's kind of there's a uniformity of what people want uh, in terms of today and how you use technology and and all the rest of it, and it's it's almost not at all about the technology. Um, but there's a real diversity of levels of experience with the technologies, f basically from zero to 100, um, which I think is, is really interesting. So maybe, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going to break this down into different technologies and how we can think about them as we go through. Um, and uh, I, I've got some things to say about NFTs and distributed ledger technology and blockchain and those sorts of things. I've got some stuff to say about AI. I've got some stuff to say about um, uh, immersive media um, and uh, VR and AR and those sorts of things. Um, but what might be helpful is if we go around again, and we, we won't record this time, but um, just to go around again and say, you know, sort of the experience with the technologies that you use, or, you know, what are the technologies that you use? What do you use them for? And maybe what's what you feel like is missing, you know? And not, um, oh, yeah, I don't use AI yet, but it would be so great if somebody would invent such and such that would solve this problem for me so that I could do X, do you know what I mean? Um, so what I hope that will open up is a conversation about, oh, well, you're, you're using that thing that I would like to use, how does that work, et cetera, et cetera. Because we've got these different ranges of experience with, with the tech. So as you saw before the break, and, I, and I'll start this off, I use a lot of um, emerging technologies, uh, particularly AI, um, to basically speed up a lot of processes that are kind of mundane. So one of the ways I use AI is integrated into tools that I was already using. Like I use um, Photoshop and Premiere Pro and uh, Lightroom and um, you know photo editing, video editing. Um, I use Adobe Audition for sound editing because I do a lot of you know uh, audio post. Um, and as AI tools are integrated into these things, the ones that speed up processes, um, I find really really useful. I find less useful standalone AI programs. Um, I use ChatGPT occasionally, um, and the only reason that the, the thing that we saw with the recording works is it plugs into ChatGPT, but basically I had to create something that was a workflow that it was a, was a bit of a pain to set up, to be honest with you. But once I'd done it, it was able to do that for me, which I find like really significantly accelerates a whole lot of other things that I can do. Um, for uh, video editing, um, there's a really great plugin uh, in some of the video editing software that will, let's say you've got a three camera record on a podcast discussion, basically push a button and cut that for me. And so when that person is speaking, cut to that person. When this person is speaking, cut to that person. If they're sort of talking across each other, cut to the wide shot. Um, and you can set it up like that, and you can do. And, it, and you will edit further from that, but it will take out, especially if you've got a one-hour conversation where people are talking the whole time, that saves you a lot of time. And it isn't the, the creative stuff that goes into it. It isn't the conversation. It isn't the final production. But it just, you know, it's something you would... I'm sorry? Why is that called? I forget. It's a plug-in. Um, I actually wrote it down here. It's one of the takeaways from so this one. Not that one. Uh, Autopod is a, is a plugin that you can get. Because, um, but there are, there are others. But what makes it useful is it's in software I already use. So if you already use like Ableton Live or you already use um, Premiere Pro or, or you know Photoshop or whatever it is, there are starting to be AI tools that fall into this. But we also need to talk about what AI is and how it works and what's a large language model and et cetera, et cetera. But for me, I just want to sort of start off by saying the tools that I use that use these new technologies are predominantly about uh, making the, the thing that used to take me three hours take me two minutes. 
uh, if I didn't want to spend my, my three hours doing that. The stuff that I like and the stuff that I want to do, that opens me up a whole lot of freedom to do that. Um, and uh, that's true of administrative tasks. Uh, it's true of you know, things like filing systems and, um, you know, category. You know, what is this document? There's a thing that um, I use from time to time called chat PDF, um, which obviously is built on top of chat GPT, but you upload a PDF to it and say, what's this about? And it will answer questions about the nature of that document. Now I get a lot to read, so it saves me a lot of time. And you can do all sorts of interesting stuff with it, like, you know, what are the main points of this? Or, you know, what is the problematic nature of this? Um, but you can also say, you know, write me a rap in the style of Beastie Boys about the 60 page document I just upload, you know. And so it's, it, you know, not particularly helpful, but it's kind of uh, fun and interesting. Um, so, anyway, that's how I use uh, technologies predominantly, particularly AI. But um, I don't use a lot of blockchain technologies except for one called uh, Blocksburg. And what Blocksburg is, is a um, it's mainly for scientific research and it's for, I have done this research, it isn't published yet, but I've done it and it's mine, here's my data set, I'm registering that, I'm getting a, a, essentially a certification that that is my thing that I made. Um, and it's like, I don't know if anyone's old enough here to have posted demo tapes of themselves in the mail to prove that they wrote that song at that time. and all the, It's that for scientific research, essentially. But you can use it for all sorts of things. So when we've written papers, we will quite often upload them to Bloxburg. It will give us essentially a hash, uh, I think 64 character or something like that, which is a, essentially a timestamp and, and certification that this was by this person on this date, and it's this information. And then it's verifiable. You know, if there is ever a dispute about, you know, at least when did you register this, not when did you write it necessarily, um, you can demonstrate that. So that's been quite useful in that respect. But the thing that I really like about it is that it isn't blockchain in the traditional sense of, uh, have you heard of proof of work? Okay, so have you heard that blockchain is ecologically catastrophic? Well, it's partly that, but basically the way in which proof works on the blockchain, and like I say, I was going to come back to this in more detail, but um, to, to, pr to, to provide evidence that this is the, you know, the correct, true thing of the world, and everybody agrees on this, is that you have to solve puzzles with computers in order to do that. So your computer needs to do a lot of work, and all of the computers on the network need to do a lot of work in order to verify that information. And not because that information needs that much work to be verified, but because you need to arbitrarily do lots and lots of complicated puzzles in order to uh, receive the verification that uh, this has happened. And it's one of the mechanisms by which blockchains originally worked, um, but there are people doing other things now to do uh, proof of you know, stake, proof of whatever. And what Bloxburg does is it uses a proof of authority uh, which is instead of everybody who uses Bloxburg is a node on the network, it's MIT is a node on the network, uh, Oxford University is a node on the network, uh, NYU is a node on the network. So these are sort of really well-established institutions that if they all say this is true, then it's true. You don't need to do as much processing in order to do that. So it's a very low impact way of doing it. So I kind of feel better about that in doing that. Um, uh, so, anyway, let's go back to what do you use currently in order to do the things that you want to do and what would you like to exist that you could use? With AI? With any new technologies. Let's say, in fact, no, in, any digital technologies that you think of as new technologies in your work. <coughs> Mm -hmm. uh, also developing plugins in C++, it's very handy. Yeah. Chat GPT. Um, also... So, sorry, just do you use ChatGPT 
to do the programming in C++? I've, I've used, yes. Okay. Speed is a lot. Sure. Written, and uh, it solves, it solves you problems if you, that take sometimes many time to, to think about it. Mm -hmm. Maybe nights, yeah. you, in one minute, it solves you the problem. Mm. Uh, and I think uh, that will have uh, enormous impact in, uh, in the speed up all the software in, in, in the world. Sure. Um, I think lots of companies are using that also. Uh, also, uh, AI can uh, do mu music much more quicker than, than we ever think about it. Mm. Um, can uh, also uh, process all audio mm -hmm. um, in ways that we in times that we were in, uh, we can't do it uh, but uh, is something miss something missing there yeah Our, uh, they are not getting the um, the ways that we understand the, the music and we, our, our brain process mm. the time with the music um, so but definitely we, we will be a, a, a good good tool in mm. the future that, that raises an interesting question does anybody here already use AI mixing or mastering or I've tried it but yeah Get you some of the way there, or yeah, or it's not helpful. Uh, well, I'm not a mastering engineer or a mixing engineer, but uh, but as a learning tool, is is as a learning tool, I've used it to compare it to my own mixes mm -hmm. to see how far I'm in in the process and uh, uh, what I need to fix. But I need I, I want to understand the uh, the basics and the foundations of that. So I don't want a tool to do all the job for me. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's good for some quick. Mixing and mastering. If you want to just release something, yeah. But uh, I think that on the long run, um, it's not very. It's it, it should, from my perspective, it shouldn't be the the main the main tool I will use for that. Right. Because I, I want to learn the behind the scenes how things work, compression, EQing, whatever. Right. So yeah, but that, that's just my personal experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking something. Uh, what? I, was, I, I was thinking about um, sequencers and drum machines, all of that, mm -hmm. that at first were very famous when they came out and they, they made simple sounds like boom, ka, boom, ka. But the thing is, it, w it sounded different, no? So it, it's, it, it was fun. But the thing w is, I think then le it, those sounds inspired drummers it wasn't impossible for them to play it. They would never thought about it because would it's uh, are things that are very um, uh, 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 not strange, but uh, not obvious. Uh, I don't want to say that word. <laughs> I think it's natural. Uh, everything is natural, but um, unobvious, not obvious, uh, and. You you can play like that. You just have to listen to it and to it. and be a drum machine. You be in, you start being so it, it can be a source of inspiration, yeah. mm -hmm. an incredible incredible source source of uh, inspiration. So yeah, I I mean beatboxing is a really interesting phenomenon because there's nothing more natural about that, right? It's it's just the human voice, but it's the human voice quite often mimicking drum machines, not drums, yeah. but drum machines. Uh, and uh, and synthesizers and you know it's most uh, more well, most of the beatboxing that I've ever heard, with very few exceptions, uh, have been replicating technological sounds through you know the natural human voice, which is, I think is really interesting. I'm a bit wor I'm a bit a bit worried uh, as a music producer. And also as a musician, uh, the future that uh, is waiting for us because uh, AI is, in, is being integ integrated already mm -hmm. in streaming 
and there are companies that are applying uh, AI to produce mu music. Yeah. So they they can do like two two four thousand musics a day. Yeah. And what what value can uh, can we have in the middle of all this when that happen ha when that future arrive to us? What do you mean value? What the value that engineers, uh, artists, mm. uh, all all the chain until <coughs> arrives to streaming, what what value they will have uh, when that technology that is right right at the at the corner, mm -hmm. maybe in two three years, one year yep. is out. Uh, what what value that persons that are in uni universities studying music, composing music, people that are uh, taking all those those jobs until streaming, mm -hmm. what value that they will have? Any thoughts? Well, I think one one possibility is that we might come back to just uh, live music, you know, because maybe with such amount of, maybe, you maybe there will be, there, there would, that will also exist, but I guess it will exist in a more creative way with a symbiosis with um, AI. I can only can imagine that. I can only right. Yes. I can only imagine that that way. I, I, I don't see a, right now it's it's difficult to to see a future with AI behind in front of us. Well. Uh, um, I just as engineering I see a future because it, it is a handy tool. Sorry. With what you see a future? I see that it is a handy tool. Do you mean sound engineering or do you mean engineering? Developing uh, products like uh, new, new instruments, new processing uh -huh. tools, yeah. new software. Oh, but all the, it's all in, in engineering and has a, a out of the engineering part, what can bring AI? If I, can I just make sure I understand you correctly? You are saying that in an age of AI, the engineers are fine and the artists are not. The artists are in trouble and the engineers are not in trouble. Uh, artists, I think the most part of the artists are in trouble. Okay. Not all, but the most part, is the, most, the big part of the artists are in trouble. Okay. Interesting. That's my, my, my vision. Sure. Yes, sorry, just a moment. It's really important to use the microphone. I just wanted to say that I, I don't come from the music field, so I could not speak about this subject as you all or most of you can. But what I wanted to say is that I think we could use these kind of technologies to have a dialogue with it. And then we can decide how they come out because we put them out. This is one thing. About the music production, I think all artists in the music, not all artists, but a lot of art is being like put it in a box when it goes to music distribution. Um, so this uh, idea that you were talking about uh, uh, about releasing something that is not made by a human being I think is so perverse as or even less perverse as other human beings trying to uh, to put uh, the artworks in a certain frame, in a certain box that would be uh, more profitable. So this is something that it was always there. Uh, and I think we can always subvert things and use it in a different way.
And this is what we can uh, think about it. This, this is my view. Also, if the, I think if the, um, if the question, because if the question is uh, that the market will be flooded with, uh, with tons of new uh, soulless music every day, I think the market is already flooded with tons yeah. of soulless music every day anyway. So it's, n it's nothing so maybe so different of, because you have a lot of, it, maybe it's not, was not AI doing it, but you have a lot of people just doing, I don't know, like, uh, I don't, <laughs> don't want to call it machine music, but like music j that just goes uh, in direction of what they think will sell more and what they think uh, will be more, um, like uh, with the TV shows or whatever, with more audiences, more profit, more, uh, so it's basically just one, another step in that same direction that we are al already living for a long, long time. Um, I don't know to which extent this can amplify that, uh, that, um, that direction and, uh, and, and flood things even uh, much more. But also, uh, we were talking before uh, about the, um, uh, Abhishek was uh, saying something about uh, uh, people starting to not use instruments and uh, to forget. Uh, uh, the thing is that even nowadays, like you have a lot of electronic bands that start to turn each time they start to turn more to, to traditional musicians because it kind of introduces something that was missing. And I think it's very easy that these new new technologies that they, they create, a, it's normal, you just get carried away. We as a species and as a society, we get carried away with this stuff. But then some, at some point we stop and we say, whoa, whoa, there's something missing here, you know? Like, hey man, this song has a real piano player in it, you know, wow. You know, so I think there there is always a moment of excess and we need that moment of excess also that things get out of balance. But then at some, in some sense, it kind of balances back again or or not, or to a different uh, direction, but uh, this is—I think this is um, this is going to happen. Like, uh, and then there will be a response to that at some point. Yeah. Let's see what response uh, that is. Yeah. So, yeah. So uh, I wanted to actually—I uh, I wanted to respond to the fact that you you, s you mentioned the value of a music producer. And I think that the value will not, uh, it will, the value will evolve, but it won't disappear because uh, there's still a difference between a tool and a creator. And I think the AI is more like, uh, I don't think AI is the creator. It's still, a, even when it comes to music, it's like, even like the, the you know, like I've never, I'm a mixing engineer, but I've never used a, uh, I would I would actually love to try to use a mm. AI mixing and see how that's different from what I would have done. Mm. But see, that's uh, the the part where I can observe and see how this is different from wha what I would do or what you would do is the part which differentiates me from the machine and like that would never change, you know? So the involvement of a human in completing a specific job is something that I think you can't really take that away. Mm. It does raise sort of an interesting question, <coughs> which is, what is so special about humans? <laughs> Seriously, no, it's a, it's a serious question. What is this magic that uh, artists and creators and, you know, that, that is this essentially human thing that we all talk about and we all understand when we talk about it, but we actually sort of question it. It's like, what is that specialness that, that computers can't replicate or that, you know, um, it, it isn't possible to, to you know, substitute it's in any way. It's feeling. Say more. Yeah. Uh, on the mic. Yeah. It's feeling. It's, it's letting your feelings uh, go out in that moment. Mm -hmm. But we're talking about recorded music. Right. So, so, yes, I can put my feelings into a piece of recorded music. Yeah. But also, if I listen to a piece of music that is created by an artificial intelligence, I'm allowed to feel feelings about sure, that. Sure, for sure, yeah. and you will. Yeah. yeah. Even yeah. if it's discussed, you will. So feelings are not out of the loop. Yes. Yeah, but, but, but at the end of the day, you, and I agree with you, in the future we'll have AI doing live shows. The thing is that... Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, no, we already have that. Yeah, yeah. we have that. Yeah. 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 <laughs> we have that, but um, more broadly, the thing is that we as humans seek for connection, and I'm not sure if I really connect with an AI on an emotional level. See what I mean? 
um, because I want to learn the, the story behind the, the singer, the, 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 the drummer, or whatever. I want to know their story, their struggles, how I relate to them, to their story, and the AI doesn't give me that. Right, see, that's interesting because your biography, this is me personally, I'm speaking and, and now. And I'm the kind of person that, goes, that likes to know the, the Yes, the but story your experience may not be generalizable. Sure. And, and, so, and I'm saying the same about me as well. I am not interested in your biography if I'm listening to your music. I'm, listening, I'm interested in your music and your, how your music makes me feel. And the record, like I play record, I'm a vinyl guy. Like I buy a record, I put the record on. I am not thinking about your relationship struggles necessarily unless they're in the content of the music. I'm not thinking about you know, whether you had a hard childhood or unless that's yeah. in the music, right? So my relationship is with the music. So if, if there is feeling that goes into the music and feeling that comes out of the music, and as you've just said, an AI-generated piece of music can make me feel feelings, yeah, sure. that relationship is still there between me as a listener and the piece of music. So my question, again, is what's the special bit that can be put into what I can hear in the music that only a human can give me? And I don't yeah, think feeling the is the AI, right answer. The AI doesn't give you, the, doesn't have the experience. That is true. You can go behind, behind. The, you can check, can check the story of the AI to you. If if you if you feel a struggle of a, uh, if someone talks about depression in a song, yeah. and you some, we all have been depressed at some point in time. Yeah. You want to know the reasons behind that song, for example. Um, I do. I, I like to know the story. You do. So yes. So I dig deeper. Yeah. And that's why the AI doesn't give me that. That's probably what it yeah. doesn't give you. I think yeah, that's, exactly, that's, absolutely, exactly. that's absolutely true. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's an interesting one, because I, I feel like I'm in a position here where I'm trying to defend AI, when I'm not actually, that isn't my, my take on this. Um, and I think that there is something special about human beings. I think there's something special about biological organisms. Um, and I think that there's something that, that human beings have more in common with a bird than they have in common with an AI, um, in, in a lot of ways. And so, there is a lot to unpack there, um, but but it's really interesting how we go immediately from what tools do you use in your day-to-day -day work to, uh, what's the of life? to well, not even <laughs> you know, the meaning of life, but but more what is the value of a human being, yeah, yeah, which is, yeah. is uh, which is a really interesting leap. But yeah, please. No, um, I was thinking about what, what I was hearing here, and um, I always feel like. The, the art in itself is created by the, the observer also, right? So we as human beings have the particular, we're particular in that sense that art doesn't exist without us mm. being able to contemplate it. Sure. So that's something that, that I think really distinguishes us from AI. Right. Right in the, the first. That we can interpret the the text. Yes, or we can feel emotions with something that we're observing or hearing, or mm. uh, that I think that's that's what, f at least for now, yeah. at least for now, uh, makes us different. But that's in a point of view of an observer, not in the producer. A point which AI can be a producer, mm. and we can. I, if I don't know who produced it, I will. I agree with you, I will also feel something about mm. what I'm listening or seeing. And what, what I bring here is like, if we think about all the things that are going to be uh, subjected to AI, which can be, we're talking about art, but I mean, almost everything I at a certain point can be eventually utilized with AI, then what are the experiences that we will have in order to become observers to be able to contemplate art at a certain point? But that's just a very thing. <laughs> I don't know. Very entropic. Uh, want to mention? Yeah. I think it was uh, Gurgle to that uh, put to to chat GPT uh, communicating into different computers uh -huh. and um, they didn't told what were the, the limits they I think they in uh, two minutes 
they shut it down, the two computers. They were talking each other in a language that we don't know. <laughs> we we could we could not they could not understand the la the language but mm -hmm. they know that they were communicating each other. Mm -hmm. So, do you think when computers have the proper sensors with the proper definition, they will not learn how to feel? I don't know. Yes, that's might maybe a in in they predict in a in a. I think 80 years, is, uh, you can download your brain into a computer. Yeah, and that's a Ray Kurzweil put, thing. And put, and put it on the cloud yeah. to use it. They, they are communicating the other side of the continent with a chip, making hands moving in a chip, with a chip in a Oh, you, you can you can already so do the the remote. There, uh, there are you know, lots of things. There is a woman in uh, the U.S. who works for NASA, who was working from home during the pandemic, and she was from her computer at home, driving the Mars rover around, like literally millions of miles away, controlling external things. That that, that isn't, I think, the thing here. I think we get. Uh, and, we, you know, what's possible, I mean, we've talked about, um, you know, the value of prediction uh, already this morning, but what's possible in 80 years' time is not our concern right now. What's possible now, I think, is, is what's really interesting. And, and I think that the, what we need to understand is, you know, let, let's, let's be really clear about what AI is and is not. Machines are not thinking. I, I'm, it's not, 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 perhaps not yet. But so uh, let's talk about language models. So technically... What a computer is doing is playing, That's guess the next word. Uh, that is literally all it's doing. So that, that uh, thing that you saw with the transcription, what is the right next word after the words that we have just had? And it's putting those in. Now, it doesn't know what words mean. It doesn't know the context for that. It doesn't have experience for those things. It has just seen a lot of words, and it has seen a lot of words in this order. And so... It's a mathematical puzzle, essentially, with language. Now, the interesting thing about language in an AI language model is anything is language. So, uh, like an image to a computer is, is language. Um, so you can show it 10,000 um, photos of cats or 10 million photos of cats, and you can show it another one and say, which one of these two is a, has a cat in it? And it will be pretty much accurate because it has learned the language of this means cat, these sort of shapes. But one of the, the really interesting things that, that comes up, there's a medical example of this, where they showed uh, a, you know, an AI, large language model, a lot of photographs of skin, of people's skin. And a lot of the photographs were, um, and it was basically to detect malignant tumors. And so this one has a spot on it, but that's fine, and this one has a spot on it, and that's not fine. And so you, you basically tag all of the photos. This one has a tumor, this one does not have a tumor. Learn that that's tumor, that's not tumor, that's tumor, that's not tumor. And so what it did is it got really, really good at spotting, and at better than doctors, um, certain types of tumors, but also um, any picture with a ruler in it, like with a, a measurement of centimeters and millimeters, um, would be detected as a malignant because most photos of of malignant cancers have a ruler next to it to show you how big the the, the thing is to show the scale of it and so basically what the ai learned was that rulers are malignant um, which is a, which is a phenomenal thing when you think about it that's what it it picked up from that because that was the consistent thing in the in the photo so i think there's so that, that's because there's no context for this. It doesn't understand illness. It doesn't understand suffering. It doesn't understand, you know, that this is skin, even. Just that this bit of data versus that bit of data, that one's bad, that one's good. And, and you know, tick those boxes. So that is the level we're at. And we are at um, single-use AI. So, again, the thing that I did with the, the voice recordings earlier that wasn't one piece of software. That was several pieces of software because one of them had to record your voice, one of them had to transcribe your voice, then one of them had to feed that into ChatGPT to say, can you summarize this? And then another one is, can you 
ask questions about this. Can you, and then format that into Notion, which is another piece of software, which is just display it to me in this particular way. With this, uh, and in fact, I had to um, actually give it specific instructions about, um, can you do it in Markdown language? So that's a heading and that's a bullet point and that's a, you know, you, you have to be, I mean, these, these things, frankly, they're quite stupid. Um, but what people are worried about is this general AI, which is where you take a piece of information and you've got some context for it and you can do something else with it and you can use that in different ways. And I think that's, uh, that's a really interesting possibility and it's a really interesting phenomenon. And I think we're going there quite quickly. Um, but again, I don't think that necessarily means that a computer is thinking about anything. Um, but also, I don't know, I, my, my tendency is to talk a lot and I really want to let you talk. Um, but I want to say this, this, uh, this fear that you're describing about what's going to happen to musicians. We've seen this so many times in so many respects. Drum Machines is a really great example about this. There aren't going to be any drummers anymore. There are drummers in this room, right? Um, uh, synthesizers, you, you're going to be able, like sequences, for instance. People are just going to make records by pressing a button, going making a cup of tea, and it'll be done when they get back. And that's true, but it hasn't stopped people making music. And it hasn't stopped people making music in all sorts of ways. It hasn't stopped traditional forms of music. It hasn't stopped jazz. It hasn't stopped classical. It hasn't stopped folk. It hasn't stopped country. It hasn't stopped. But it's, what it's done is it's added to the palette of what's currently available. And some people don't like it. Um, and, and I think that, that this idea that, yeah, like, okay, so there's a really interesting phenomenon. Who heard about the Drake thing? Okay, right. Basically, there's this very famous artist called Drake. Somebody did an AI-assisted, let's say, version of Drake doing a song that Drake had never recorded. Um, and put it out on streaming and said, this is not Drake, this is an AI. This is AI Drake, fake Drake, if you like. Um, and it's had like well over a million views. With people knowing that it's not Drake, people who are Drake fans knowing that it's not Drake, but I like this and I like that it sounds just like Drake. Now, one of the things that happened was that got taken down off the, off the internet because of a copyright challenge by Drake's record label, Universal Music. Now, what does that mean? Does that mean Universal owns the sound of Drake's voice, <laughs> right? Uh, because th there was no composition there that Drake was even remotely involved in. Certainly the record label had never signed that particular recording. So there's some really interesting questions come into that. Yeah. But the people who liked fake Drake <laughs> also liked Drake, right? They, they're not going to stop liking Drake and go, oh, well, I'm done with that guy. This is much better. But do these people like the song or do they just go, well, it's a novel? They liked the song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They liked the song. The song was good. Um, if you like Drake music, this was a good song, right? Um, so, th and that's a really good point because the guy who did it, yes, he used AI to emulate Drake's voice, but he's also a composer and producer and he made a good song and he put his own voice as guide vocals, and then got the AI to replace the guide vocals with something that sounded like Drake. Made a good song. The joke was that it sounded like Drake doing it, but people liked the song. And, and I can imagine a world where Drake and fake Drake coexist, right? Um, now, what that means economically yeah. is a really interesting question. I don't think Drake is in any danger whatsoever. But what Grimes did is really interesting. So what Grimes did is said, take my voice, use my voice, whatever you want to do, just give me half, right? It's, you know, <laughs> you're going to use my voice, you're going to promote it as a sort of fake Grimes, the rest of it, let's, let's collaborate, you know? You've got my voice, you make some music, go for it, give me half. And whether people will do that or not, I don't know, it's an interesting question, but I don't think that fake Grimes in the world, no matter how many of them there are, takes away from Grimes in the world. Um, and nor does it, I think, take away from the relationship that Grimes fans have with their fandom. You know, I, don't know, I don't know the extent to which they have a, a relationship with Grimes herself, but, uh, but with the music and with the, you know, the fandom, you know, I think that's still a real thing. And I, and I, I think that it seems unlikely that that's going away quickly. But the, the word value, I think, is a real sticking point here because 
that is a conversation that almost every conversation with musicians or with record labels or with producers about music, the word value always comes up and everybody means something different when they say that. Um, and for a lot of people, the value of music is its price, right? And, and given the conversation that we've had this morning, that's probably offensive to most of the people in this room. But, but it's a thing. So here's, here's an interesting thing. Let's take this back to blockchain for a second. 2016, blockchain was sort of like the buzzword at the time. And one of the things we did at MTF is we had, it was one of our first labs, actually. We did a blockchain lab. Um, and as we do, we bring together people you know, from different backgrounds, computer scientists and cryptographers with record label people, people from um, uh, you know, collection societies, royalty agencies, composers, publishers, all in the same room together. Go, right, this is this thing called blockchain. This is how it works. What's it for? What do we do with it? Um, and we very, very quickly started with the idea of, okay, is this, or how could this be, a way that makes music more fair? Okay, because that's one of the things that people talk about when they talk about blockchain and music. Well, we can use it to make it more fair. And we spent five days, and the, the purpose of this was to either make something or, or generate a white paper or you know, come up with something that these brains in the room could collectively agree on as, as a thing that, that comes out of this. That was the purpose of that lab. And we spent five days talking about what fair means. <coughs> because again, like value, it's one of those words that nobody agrees on. Um, because everybody has this concept of fair from their own perspective. What's fair for me as, as, a, as a publisher, right? What's fair for me as a publisher is I get to keep doing the things that I've always done and still continue to make money out of that. Thank you very much. And if this is going to take away from that, then there's a real problem in the world. Now, that's always going to be the case with any technology, like with, with, um, with print. Like, I mean, is there anybody who thinks that print is a technology we should have abandoned at birth and it should just, we should just not have bothered with it? And yet there was an entire like, massive industry of scribes whose whole thing was to copy manuscripts and take the manuscript back to the, the monastery where they could put it you know, into their library and hope that, you know, unlike Alexandria, theirs wouldn't burn down. Right? So, but there isn't anybody alive today who thinks that print was a bad idea. We should never have bothered with it. Um, but there's always a change and, uh, like a, and a real existential threat to people who have these creative and, and uh, interesting pastimes. Now, I, I don't think that, I, in fact, I don't think for a second that AI is going to do away with musicians. Um, I actually think that, like I, th I think I said it uh, earlier on, I think that more music in the world is fundamentally a good thing, regardless of its source, right? I think that, that just lots and lots more music, and this is one of the things I absolutely love about the internet, is that there is so much shit music in the world. Um, and I think it's fantastic because the more of that there is in the world, the more great music there's going to be. Because I don't know about you, but anybody that I know who started making great music started by making crap music, right? And they got, and their taste was way beyond what their ability to generate that was. But they worked towards it and they just kept doing the work and kept getting better and better at it and better at it. And I think that the, the fact that the technology that's around enables us to not just create music, and actually, like the example I gave with the violin earlier, like but nobody wants to hear you learn to play the violin, seriously. But now there are musical instruments where you can start already sounding pretty good, but you can still become phenomenal at those things, and that's going to take work. And I think that's the, the really fascinating thing about AI is you don't start here like a violin player. You don't even start here like a harmonica player. Uh, you start here where you can put out a song that other people might want to listen to, but then you can build on that and you can learn, why did that work? What was good about that? How can I make that? How can I make that different? How can I make that something that that AI would not have done? How can I make that sound like me? Because a lot of the people, when they're talking about musical creation, they talk about, there's this word that comes up a lot, which is expression. It's about expressing myself. I had an argument, one, oh no. yeah, it was an argument, um, with a very, very well-known composer uh, in Britain. Uh, and 
I said to him, I, I thought of music as, as a, like a form of communication. Um, and he said, that was bullshit. It's not communication at all. It's got nothing to do with me trying to communicate with another human being. I am not interested. Once it gets out of me, people can do whatever the hell they want with it. It's, it I'm not interested in that relationship beyond that. He said, it's about expression, right? I want to get what's inside of me out. Now, 99 out of 100 composers, I suspect, would disagree with that, but it's a fair position. But there is this thing which is like the, there is something inside of me that needs to get out, and I need to get it out in the form of music, and this is how I want to, you know, put myself out into the world. And the fact that there's so much of it out there doesn't prevent you from doing that. In fact, if anything, it makes it more possible. Um, but can prevent you from leaving can't prevent from you being expressed, yeah. but can prevent uh, having tons of things, tons of noise in the world. It's almost impossible for you to live from that. Right, so this is where it gets different. This is where the value of music is its price, right? It's because we've all been talking about artistic creation, artistic expression, and about, you know, I want to be you know, true to my humanity and my values, and I want to, you know, uh, this creative expression and, and, you know, community and connection and all the rest of it. But ultimately, it turns up at this place where I need to make a living in the way that I've always made a living from, from doing this. Um, I, I think that making music your job quite often stops you from doing the things that you want to do with music. You know, I, I know people who, who, are, who are in orchestras that are just soul-destroying. Um, but music is their career, and that was always their dream, and you know, yada, yada, yada. There are all sorts of arguments about that. I, okay, so here is a thing that I used to say when I, when I started doing mu new music strategies. This is 2000, maybe 2005, 2006, something like that. And there was a lot of moral panic about free MP3s on the internet. This is before streaming, so nobody really had any sort of solution to how do we make money of people listening to music that isn't costing them anything to buy. We, we can check just one, one thing. How many bands existed in the 80s and 90s, and how many bands exist now? How many bands existed? Before? Are you asking me like I might have an answer to that? Yes. No, it, it is a, a, an answer for the problem of living. Uh, with the crowded right. Okay, market. so do you think now we don't see almost? I think maybe half of the bands that existed before. Now we just see mu musicians. All all uh, artists are working uh, has a self-titled. Uh, Artists. Right, okay, so the, the big clue in what you just said and is the word band, right? Bands so you are, are, are getting out. Yeah, 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 yeah. but, but they, okay, yeah. so, so let, me, let me just pick you up on that because I think that's really important. You are talking about bands, they, and yes, bands is a very... Five, six, seven... Is that a natural way for music to exist? No, uh, I think... Is that the way music should be? It should be... Drums, guitar, bass, vocals, and keyboards. Uh, because it, it, it used to be a very big, very popular thing. Before that, it wasn't such a big, such a popular thing. After that, it's not such a big, such a popular thing. The fact that bands have gone away, I don't think is a technological problem. I think it's a cultural, I don't think it's a problem. I think it's a cultural thing. I think that there's a lot of collaborations between individual artists coming up. I think there's a lot of people who are professionally songwriters in a way that they haven't been able to do for 40, 50 years, yeah. and that's come around again. Um, I think that's a really fascinating phenomenon that you've described, but I don't think that it's an existential crisis in the way that you're framing it. Maybe. Unless you want to be in a band. Yeah, but maybe supporting a band live is getting, each time that is passing, more difficult to have a, a, a band and support all the members, all the, the the, the things that are around a, a band, instruments, uh, also the the journeys, the 
everything that the band can needs to support. Sure. Okay. So here's the thing about the 80s and 90s. I don't know. Were you in a band in the 80s and 90s? Uh, I had. I had. Okay. Did you have access to a recording studio and a record deal? No. Did you have tour support or no, or it roadies? Not my thing. I, I left it. Right. Okay. So yeah, me too. I was in a band. We were terrible. Like really terrible. Um, we had a great songwriter, but we did not do justice to those songs. Um, and, but one of the hardest things for a band in the mid to late 80s, which is when we were around, was being allowed to record. That was a hellishly expensive thing. Yeah. Um, and uh, we didn't have a record deal. Uh, so we saved up our money to get into this, honestly, frankly, pretty crappy studio. Uh, we made some pretty terrible demo tapes, and that was the end of it, and quite rightly so, probably. But if I was doing that now, I could make studio quality recordings. My kid could make studio quality recordings. Their friends could make studio quality recordings. That barrier has been taken away from me. Bands do not have the problems that bands had in the 80s and 90s, and I think that's a great thing. And I think that's a technological thing to a large extent, but also it means that I think that I would, okay, here's, here's the thing. I think there are a thousand times the number of bands now that are yeah. operational and, and that have an audience than were then. Also, I, I think that there, there, uh, the, 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 the money around music now mm -hmm. is the, 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 the most high of, of, of all times. The, there's more money in music than ever before. Never sure. Before. And like every other period in history, in history very little yeah, goes to the musicians. True. So, <laughs> where the money is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, uh, yes, different people are taking the money from the musicians, but people have always taken money from the musicians. You know, that's not a new thing. Um, but, <laughs> but, but here's the thing I was going to say. If there are a thousand times as many artists and they're not all... It's, it's not like you win the lottery and your first prize is 10 years on a bus, which is what it used to be, right? Um, you know, and you'd get a record deal and, um, you know, sell a million records and you'd, you know, maybe you'd make a little bit of money out of it and you'd be touring around and, and there's this whole kind of toxic culture around that whole, you know, sort of superstardom and fame and, and all the rest of it. But now that I, I know quite a lot of people who are not famous and are not millionaires and pay their rent making music. Um, and you haven't heard of them and lots of people haven't heard of them and that's fine. There are enough people who have that like their music, that support what they do and, you know, so there is now this kind of middle area. It's not sort of lottery winners and everybody else gets nothing. Now there's a sort of whole spread thing. Now what I really like the idea of, and this comes back to affordances, is not what does the technology do to the creative musician, but what possibilities are there in the technology for the creative musician? How can you use this? Not, not what's happening to me, but what's available? What's the environment like? What, you know, this room with a table in it, can I dance on the table? Um, and you know, that's, that's really the sort of the, the approach I want to take. But I feel like, again, that I'm sort of taking the conversation in, a, in an interesting direction. Mm. That, it, that wasn't the intention of it. Um, let's talk about money for a second, though, because I think that's really important. Um, and, okay, here, first of all, let's do, since we've got a few more people in the room this time, um, hands up the musicians, the people who think of themselves as musicians. Okay, right, put your hands down if, no, no keep your hands up. Put your hands down if you would stop making music if it was not making you money anymore. Right, okay. So, money, like right, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so so I, I, I don't think that the, this idea of um, the commercial jeopardy that technology introduces actually even impacts on whether or not musicians are making music. I think that there is, like for me, 
The best possible world is one in which people who want to make their career out of music can make their career out of music and do very well. Thank you very much, because I think they create a lot of value. Um, and even if it's not value for me, it's value for somebody else. I think, the, but value, I don't mean commercial value, I mean like the, these things that we value in the world, like, you know, yeah, yeah, but also, you know, like, you know, your children and, you know, like this is, there's this great cartoon, I don't know if you've ever seen it, there's this, this cartoon, uh, sort of one panel cartoon on the internet about somebody showing another person his, um, uh, his record collection, his vinyl collection. He said, uh, yeah, they, they might be sort of um, uh, expensive and, you know, hard to, you know, and, and, you know, hard to store in the but at least they're inconvenient, you know. Um, and, and you think about it, and it, actually, all of the things that we treasure in the world are expensive and inconvenient. You know, your kids, for instance. You know, you don't want more convenient, cheaper kids, right? Um, <laughs> so this is how I think about, right? <laughs> This is how I think about how, how I think about you know um, my record collection. It's like part of the thing that I love about it is that this is something that that it takes my attention. It takes you know it's it's something that I invest into and it's you know yada yada yada. NFTs have become part of this you know magic solution for artists. This uh, this idea that you can now put something up on the internet that has artificial scarcity. Right? The, the problem with digital music is that it's absolutely replicatable. Um, that uh, if it ex you know, there is no such thing as the original MP3, really, is there. No. There, is, there, is, you know, there are only copies and copies of copies, and they are identical. You know, it's not like uh, duplicating a cassette where it degrades over time. It's like this MP3 and that MP3 are both the original and neither of them are. And, and there has always been this kind of impulse to introduce the scarcity of the physical world into the world of um, digital technologies. And I mean, let's get your thoughts on that. You know, is this something that we should be working towards? Is this something that should be possible? Because I mean, technologically, it is possible to to make it so that you know this this file is is the you know. Maybe original is not the right word, but it's the it's the authentic one. Yeah. Uh, so uh, if I do a, a, a record on an logic on a tape or a vinyl directly, I only make one first try, first record, and so only one, mm -hmm. and I can sell it for a million, like uh, like it was a painting of Matisse, or because it's only one. Only one painting, but if I make a copy of the painting, the copies are cheap, but the, the original is still uh, valuable. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't happen with music. I don't know. No, <laughs> it has happened with music. Um, it was uh, Wu Tang Clan. Yeah, yeah, which is which is you know they made. Yeah, and Martin Shkreli was the one who bought it. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, basically, the worst human on the planet bought, as you might expect, the most expensive record on the planet. Um, and yeah, that was an interesting. And like, no, nobody thought it was the value of a Matisse, but they put a very high price on it, and they're only making one. But it was Wu Tang Clan, right? You know, they they didn't get to be Wu Tang Clan by only releasing one record. You know, they the record was valuable because everybody already liked them. Um, so yeah, that, that is a you know, it's an interesting phenomenon. But there are people who are putting out these sort of um, you know, one of you know, buy one of ten of this particular you know digital file. Um, yeah, but that's maybe introducing an artificial scarcity in a medium that is not created for scarcity. No, yeah, so sure. what you are trying to create is is just market, uh, is just create demand. Uh, by the fear of missing out, no? yeah. So uh, your question is uh, is very relevant. Like, should uh, digital should we create scars? Try to create scarcity in a medium that doesn't that is not made for that. No. Yeah. I got, well, I can't answer that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I don't even question. know if that's the right question. Um, I think it's, what does it mean that we try to? I think is probably more interesting because there there are. I mean, there are. Uh, Artists who have made 
absolute fortune selling NFTs. Do I think that's the way in which we're going to make money from music in the future? No, not at all. Don't think that for a second. Um, but I think that some people have, and this is something that I was going to get to before, and it's probably worth saying before you, before you dive in here. One of the things that I used to say a lot uh, when I was first running New Music Strategies, the, the, the website, you know, sort of giving advice to musicians who were trying to struggle with the internet, is you do not have the right to make money from your music. You have the opportunity to make money from your music. And that's a different thing. And, and like, I don't have to give you money just because you make music. You have to create, that, there has to be value there for me in order to do that. And you don't get to decide what value is. Uh, this, if we're going to live in a, in a capitalist society, then that's what the market's job is, to, to decide what and what is not valuable. Um, and so this idea that keeps coming around when people start talking about the relationship between uh, recording artists particularly making money versus the internet. That's sort of like, that's how it's, it's, it's staged. And I demand to make money in the way that I always used to, regardless of the changes in the technological environment. I will not change even when everything else is, you know, because it's hard, because this is the way that I've chosen to do it, because this is what I do, this is my art, give me money. Um, and it's kind of not how it works. But you do have the opportunity to make money by creating value for people. And it might manifest itself in all sorts of different ways. Um, like the one example that people keep trucking out is like, I, you know, what if I give away my music and sell the t-shirts? Sure, if that works for your audience and that's what they're into, that's, you know, that's perfectly fine. But again, it's like, um, there's a whole lot of moral panic around streaming as well. Like, st nobody's making money from streaming. Well, some people are making money from streaming, but, but actually that's a, you know, that's a, a lot of people, that's how they experience music, that's how they choose to listen to music. So do you want your music to be where people can hear it? And then do you want to find a way in which you can make money from it? Yes, I think it's terrible that, that um, you know, these awful human beings are being exploitative in the corporate world. You know, was it ever any other way? Um, but yeah, I'm sorry, you were going to say. Yeah, no worries. And, and a, lot of, a lot of bands are no longer selling merchandise because the venues take like a 30 or 40 cut yeah. of the sales. Yeah. So that's why you no longer see people selling t-shirts and that yeah. kind of stuff, which is, well, it doesn't matter. Yeah, um, but which, which, kind of, which kind of underlines it's the sad. fact that the problem is not technological, it's, it's human beings yeah, yeah, are yeah, problem. For sure, for yeah. sure, for sure. Yeah. And, and uh, linking to the question of marketing strategies, you already see a lot of bands saying that this is our farewell tour. Right. And after 10 years, they're back. Oh, yeah. Um, so, when, when the money run, runs out, they're back. Mm. Um, but they sell a ton, a, ton of, a ton of shows just because it's the last one. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I get the feeling that it's, it's part of the strategy sometimes. Absolutely. You know the best strategy for having an absolute sellout tour in 2023 is to have a hit record in 1987. Okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's because... That, that's who's spending large sums of money on going to see concerts. It's me, you know. It's it's you know the it's the people to whom, you know. I, I was you know kind of into Duran Duran at the time, but if they played near me, I would absolutely go and see them. And oh my God, it's how much for a ticket? I'm not going to see them. They're not going to be around forever. I'm going to pay it, right? But but that is you know I, I love the fact that there are small venues with young artists who are playing and coming up and, and all the rest of it. Some of them are in bands, some of them are in you know different combinations of things. That's all great. You know, I don't I'm not representative of anything from from a, a music consumer perspective. So I'll hesitate to go further on that. But you're right. It's it's like there are marketing strategies and there are sales strategies and there are ways in which you can make money from music. And this is why I sort of lean on the whole thing about uh, affordances. It's like, so what's possible with this technology? What can I do? What could I use? Um, both creatively and, you know, because here's an interesting question that, that um, a friend of mine brings up quite a lot. Is like, you can ask as much as you want, how can I make more money in the music industry? But an equally valid question is, how can I spend less money in the industry, you know, in the music industry? You know, what are the things that are currently cutting out from, from me you know, realizing that value. 
And a lot of it is I'm giving 40% to a, a merch guy. Um, I'm, you know, uh, the percentage on streams is, is, is bonkers, so I'm just going to put all my music on Bandcamp or, you know, whatever it might be. Um, but you can make all sorts of interesting decisions based on what's available to you. Yes. May I talk about that? Of course. Mm. I just wanted to add, uh, we're only t uh, talking about uh, music in the music field. And you gave the example of Matisse, which is my field. Matisse has never, ever, ever, ever uh, had any more money. And everyone speculates his work uh, until today. Mm. So, and one great thing about the NFTs is that uh, for visual artists, you can always, uh, you can agree to always get a bit of this money. Uh, from resale. For, from resale, yeah. while other people are making a lot of money with your work, which I think is great. Mm. And I don't know is, if it's what you wanted to talk about now, but it's in light. Mm -hmm. uh, it's also good that we think that uh, we can agree to speculate, but we can agree how to invest this uh, money in ethical ways. For example, by uh, giving money to social projects, to new political ideas, to new cultural uh, ways of interacting uh, and putting people interacting together. So again, this is always a perspective that we have to think about and make the right decisions. The right decisions, the ethical decisions that are good for our collective experience, mm -hmm. I, I would say. Well, how do we take those decisions? This is for everyone, <laughs> for me too. How do we take these decisions? How do we decide what's, a, what's ethical? Government. Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> <laughs> the judge. I mean, it, 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 yeah, it's an interesting thing that, like, talking about technology brings you to discussions of, you know, what it means to be human, about what ethics are, you know, all these sorts of things are, are I think, fundamental. And it shows that technology is a, is a very human thing to, to think about and discuss. And it's core to how we go out into the world, how we express ourselves, you know, how we make an impact, how we do the things that we do. And I think that this question of ethics is a, is a really interesting one. And it's a changing field, for instance. I mean, like, AI is one of the most interesting ethical areas um, because there are some clear ethical problems in, you know, what's in the data set. You know, the, to the extent that um, uh, driverless vehicle data that was trained on um, was much better at seeing white pedestrians. Uh, okay, there's an ethical issue right there, right? Um, because it, it had been shown, this is what a pedestrian looks like, that's what a pedestrian looks like, here's a pedestrian. And very few of those people. How you control what is true and not true in AI? How do you control so what is what true? What is true and not true, because uh, AI can bring that, that high issue. It can start to to mix uh, several examples and to give a conclusion that is not true. Absolutely, and it happened. Uh, yeah, for sure. And people are also a problem in that area. Look at social media. Mm -hmm. right, look at so so. Here's a really interesting framework. How are we for time? Okay, it's ten past four. We're going to go. This was sort of my thing when I was an academic professionally, was um, uh, what's called tetradic analysis, and, which is a fancy way of saying, here are four questions that you ask about everything, because everything has these four effects. What does it enhance? What does it make obsolete? What does it retrieve that had been made obsolete before this? And what is it that it reverses into? By which I mean, um, 
what is the opposite of what it looks like it's about that it will inevitably become about? Um, because that's always what happens. If four things. So any new technology, so the, the, the last one is, is, the short way of saying is what does it reverse into? But what that means is um, this thing looks like it's 100% about X. It will end up being the opposite of that, right? Um, so, really good example of that, social media, like Facebook for instance. What does Facebook enhance? Uh, conversations with friends uh, and, and connections with people that I haven't seen since school. Okay? Uh, what does it make obsolete? Um, okay, uh, pen pal letters, uh, it makes a whole bunch of email obsolete, it makes forums, forums. yeah, makes forums obsolete. Um, what does it retrieve? What, what used to be a thing and then wasn't a thing, but now this brings back town squares. Town squares. Um, yeah, the, the public forum, the the um, uh, the salon, you know. Uh, and what does this look like? You know, what does this look like? It's going to be about, but actually, it's going to be about completely the opposite: democracy. Right? It looks like it's going to be a place where people come together and share their ideas. It is the single most divisive thing that has ever been invented and it has split people who can now never talk to each other ever, ever again. That's how the, the, you know, the tetrad uh, works. What, what does it enhance? What does it obsolesce? Uh, what does it retrieve? And what does it reverse into? And I, I think that's a really interesting thing to apply to any new technology just to sort of wave flags about what well, this is. So, you know, we can do this with AI. Um, what does AI enhance? Productivity, yeah, absolutely. Um, what else? Creative starting points, you know? Um, uh, you know? Creative options. Creative options, yeah, sure. Okay, what does it obsolesce? Writer's block for a start. Yeah. Um, writer's block is when you, you have a blank page and you just, oh, I don't know, you know. Um, what else? Uh, a lot of admin, right? There's uh, that transcribing the text that you guys said before. I used to do that. I used to do interviews for magazines and I used to type out all of the words that the people said so I can get a story out of it. That, that's obsolete now. What does it retrieve? What does AI bring back? that uh, had gone away? Time? Yeah, maybe, maybe. I would say collaboration would be one thing. Like, I, f I'm, I'm, I used to be sitting at my lap, you know, because just before AI, I was still using digital technologies. It was just me and my laptop. Now I feel like I have this collaborative, relationship going on, at least with something, that I used to have before I was just sitting by myself at my laptop, right? One is missing something, you go there. Yeah. Ask. yeah, 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 exactly. So there is, a, there is a conversational element to my work now. You, you ever use ChatGPT, you're going back and forth, right? And it's developing as it goes along. There is a sort of, uh, so, okay, that's, that's one thing. Yeah, one. yeah, yeah, sure. I just wanted to say that uh, for a while ago, you asked what makes us really humans. Uh -huh. And I think it's our relation, our subjective relation to the world, which makes it unique, and our uh, capacity to enter in a dialogue. And, uh, and uh, with, uh, with uh, AI, we can have like a dialogue with a, almost with a collective intelligence. I mean, there's this no individual expression as you were talking about, uh, is something that is not feeling or uh, giving meaning, mm -hmm. but in the relation of what it gives to us, with us, it gives us meaning. And it's uh, fantastic, I think, because it's like learning from everyone, from the collective experience. So we can say that we would have a conversation with a collective experience which I find it really interesting. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. It, there's a lot to talk about there, for sure. Um, no, 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 for sure. <laughs> Let me finish on this tetrad, because we've just got one to go, which is the reversal thing. What does AI look like it's about, but actually it's going to turn into the opposite of that? 
looks like the end of the world. It looks like the end of the world. Yeah, okay. and it looks Wouldn't like it be nice if that wasn't true? It's going to f to give you more free time for you to do the stuff you, you love. Yes. But at the end of the day, I, I don't think that will happen. Yeah, yeah. Name a labor-saving device that has caused I you less work. I think we are always speeding, speeding up things yeah. to a level that we will not stand at that. that Thank you. I think in a way it just uh, gives us the freedom to do uh, what we want faster, mm -hmm. but it also menaces our um, our finances. Maybe in the if we keep thinking as we thought uh, before it came along, mm. right? So. One of the things that you hear a lot about AI, particularly, is it's going to take all our jobs. And it's going to reinvent them. It's, right? co it's currently causing me work, I have to say. We have to work, we have to adapt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May I say just a joke? Yeah. Because it's kind of a joke, because everyone is always like uh, saying, oh, the aliens, they are not coming, because, oh, they are, uh, when they, they come, maybe they, and we all have the, uh, this idea with the aliens, with the machines, now with the uh, artificial intelligence that we, it's going to be the end of the world, man, as you were saying. But I think this is just a projection of ourselves because if we, if I would see like an alien, which would be like a insect, like completely big, and I would have the fear, oh my God, it's going to kill me. What would I do as an immature being, as I am being a human being? Probably I would kill him. So I think we are just projecting our fears, which are the reflection of ourselves. Hmm. Yeah, but also Tiago was saying that uh, we, you know, we, mm, we can look at this in very different perspectives and we can be very optimistic, but that with the uh, big possibilities, also can be possibilities for catastrophe. Mm. But that's, that's uh, also connected to what we were talking before, that these are extensions of ourselves. What we do with them is, uh, but of course, the more powerful our extensions are, the more they are powerful for good and the more they can damage also. Yeah. So yeah, it's important to think about that uh, for sure, no? Also, I, w I was listening to you guys on streaming, which uh, great technology, I love it. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, um, and I was, yeah, the other day uh, I was thinking, you know, so we, we've been organizing this, this program for months and it's been a non nonstop. Uh, uh, and uh, in these moments is when I crave more just sitting at the, in the studio and uh, by myself and uh, making music, you know, because yeah, it's, everything is speeding up. And that as it speeds up, the more you feel the need uh, for your own time to do your own thing that makes you reconnect with yourself, no? But mm. at the same time, um, you are always engaging in new activity, new, you know, and searching further, further, and that makes you uh, speed a lot. So uh, I think it has also to do a lot with what we were talking before when uh, we were um, discussing what we wanted from this day and what we wanted, uh, that is to find balance mm. and to find a healthy uh, or our own healthy balance between uh, in the usage and in the engagement with these technologies with which technologies do you th we think are beneficial for ourselves mm -hmm. and uh, and to ha to which amount you know and um, yeah I think that's uh, um, one of the big points that brought us here also today I think uh, at the end of the time we will live quicker, quicker, and more quicker. This is a really, uh, it's a really popular and well, uh, uh, well thought out is wrong. I don't think it's well thought out. It's, it's, it's a, a very commonly and often repeated idea, this idea of you know, perpetual acceleration of technology um, and perpetual acceleration. And there is this, um, this uh, what's called the sing singularity theory. It's a, it's a little bit like you talked about before in you know, 80 years time, we're gonna download our brains into robots and they're gonna go out into space. Can, and, and we you know, can also look uh, Rapture of the nerds, they call that, yeah. yeah. If we l maybe look at the 70s, 80s when microwave came, came, 
an example, like mm -hmm. uh, what impact had uh, a microwave uh, to cook uh, had in our lives uh, before people would have to cook, they needed more time, mm -hmm. they would be more in family, waiting for cooking to come out. And right. Today, after micro microwave came out, mm -hmm. it just getting... Do, I mean, can, so as somebody who cooks a lot, I don't think that microwaves... It's an example. No, no, it's a, it's a really good example because of the flaws in the example. Um, microwaves don't make us cook in a particular way. So there are some things that I use a microwave for. I use a microwave for rice. And, and there are a lot of people who would be horrified at that. But actually, I think that a microwave does pretty good rice most of the time, particularly if I'm going to dry it overnight and I'm going to make fried rice the next day. I think microwave does pretty bloody well. I don't use it for almost anything else apart from occasionally defrosting some meat. Um, so I, I cook a lot with fire. I cook a lot with, um, I do a lot of slow cooked stuff. Um, but the, the point is, I have access to a microwave just like everybody else does, but that's not how I choose to use it. And I think that, yes, that all technologies are the same. Technologies don't make us behave in a particular yeah, way. They, most of the people, they, they go, go inside the, the time they, they took it before mm -hmm. to eat. Uh, now is maybe enough of that time of 20, and they are using that time for other things. Mm -hmm. But are you saying that's a good thing or a bad thing or just a thing? And quicker and quicker and quicker. Right. AI will do that. Sh oh, it will certainly you allow that, yeah. You will live because it gives you more free time, but you you will have that time, but you, you have to use it even quicker than you did before. There is a macro level to this, which is sort of like the next level up in terms, and we talked about the ages of media before. We talked about, you know, how there was... There was, uh, before the digital age, there was the electric age. And before the electric age, there was the print age. Before the print age, there was the scribal writing age. Before that, there was the oral age of, of people sitting around campfire and telling each other stories. And, and the really interesting thing is this oral age where the main way in which people communicated was like this, sitting around. And, and of course, this hasn't gone away, but we still sit around and sometimes there's a microphone and sometimes there's streaming technology and the rest of it. But we're basically sitting around a campfire telling stories, right? Um, and that, as the main way in which people communicated, lasted probably about, I don't know, 20,000 years. Um, and then we learned writing. And writing pretty quickly became the main way in which the important communication and the world took place. All of the transactions, all the financial records, all the who owes what to whom. You know, I, I swap my two donkeys for your, you know, 10 bales of corn, whatever it is. Um, but there's a lot of, of history was um, the scribal period. And that's, you were talking about 5,000 years there. And then the printing press comes along and print becomes the main way in which knowledge is exchanged and recorded and, you know, communicated and so on. And that lasts about 500 years. And then electric technology comes along. You've got radio, you've got television, you've got um, you know, records, uh, you've got you know, films, you've got all of these sorts of things. And that becomes the main way of communication in the world, becomes the way in which, you know, and it shapes our brains, how we do those things and how we communicate and so on. And that lasted about 100 years. And then we get into the digital age, right? And that lasts... I don't know. Let's let's date it from CDs, right? Uh, so eighty-five ish, um, and what's that been now? Not in forty years, you know. Um, and and is there a next? And what happens? The rest of it. And there's a lot of, like a lot of the the anxiety is not just about, you know, what what is AI going to do to us, or what's you know you know the um, ecological impacts of blockchain and the rest of it, but just like history is speeding up, um, and you know there is this sort of exponential curve. Yeah, ex exactly. Now, some people think what that means is ultimately humans and technology will merge, and there will no longer be a distinction between one and the other. I mean, at the moment we can go, that's AI. I'm a person. This is human. That's machine. Um, and there is this theory called the singularity theory, which is like that exponential curve will 
create a collision, and there is not going to be a, a meaningful difference between humanity and technology. Right. I think that's nonsense. Um, and I think it's nonsense for two reasons. One is, that's always been true. This is a piece of technology. That is a part of me that, that right? So this enables me to see further. Quite exactly, you're right. So this distinction of me and not me is, is a really kind of, uh, that's an interesting ontological discussion that which we could have, you know, till the cows come home. But also, if you know anything about exponential curves, they never meet the straight line, right? They get closer and closer and closer and never come to it, yeah. Um, that, that is the nature of exponential. So yes, it will, I, I, I believe, uh, continue to increase. But there's a really interesting other way that I like to think about it. And this goes back to that essay that I talked about at the beginning. And I'll, I'll tell you where this goes so that you don't have to read it, because who wants that? Um, is like these five ages of media that we have already experienced, the oral age, the scribal age, the print age, the electric age, the digital age, right? Those map on really nicely to something from uh, literary criticism. There was a, a literary theorist called Northrop Fry, who was uh, based in Toronto in the 50s, 60s. And he had this theory about how literature has worked over history. And he said, right, so at the beginning, there was the uh, mythological age of, of, uh, of storytelling, right? There's gods and monsters, right? And then came the romantic period where it was, you know, castles and princesses and dragons and, you know, all these sorts of things. And then there was this period called, we'll call it the high mimetic. Mimetic meaning like life, but high mimetic meaning like the life of rich people, right? So that was, that was, that was what literature was. And then there was the low mimetic period, which, as you guess from the title, like life, but for poorer people. Suddenly we're in Charles Dickens and Oliver Twist and, you know, all the rest of it. And then beyond that, you get into irony and satire. You get into Kafka, and you get into, you know, the, sort of this twisted view of the world, uh, which is like kind of the opposite of the mythological. It's this really sort of upside down world in which everything is terrible and and bureaucratic and you know uh, and horrible in those respects. And he said, what what happens when you go beyond? Kafka. What happens when you go beyond irony? You've started with mythical, uh, you know, mythological, romantic, high mimetic, low mimetic. Myth what happens when you fall out the bottom of that? And his theory is, well, you end up back at the top. But you end up back at the top with the experience of having gone through those things. So this is not new territory for you anymore. You understand the rules of these things as they're coming. And you've seen these things before. And so what's really interesting is you get to transcend that whole thing and you get to tell the stories, like mythical stories, in a way that understands all of those other things, all of the, the high mimetic, low mimetic, you know, the, the satirical thing. You get to do gods and monsters from the point of view of somebody who understands Kafka, right? Which is a really, really powerful position to be in. That's a really interesting phenomenon. And this is what's happening. It's really interesting that you're wearing an MCU t-shirt uh, yeah. Miguel, sorry, sorry. yes, uh, because this is where that comes true, right? The DC, Marvel, those sorts of things. You look at, and I think, I, I made the argument once, a kind of a joke argument in a lot of ways, but I made the argument in a blog post once that, that um, Avengers Assemble, the first Avengers film, is the single most important cinematic moment in history. Um, because... That's the moment when a Shakespeare scholar, Joss Whedon, wrote about gods and monsters from the point of view of somebody who understands Kafka, right? So this is when that whole story that Northrop Fry came up with about the entire history of literature was distilled on the screen for a mass global audience. That's like the, one of the most powerful things you can think of in, in storytelling. Um, and like you get, there are, you know, this is why we've got so many reboots. This is why Batman keeps starting again, because people want to tell the story from the beginning, from the point of view of somebody who understands the history of storytelling. We are not in Adam West Batman territory anymore and have not been for a little while. Um, we're in a Batman territory that is, 
you know, post Kafka, post irony, post satire, um, but understands all the storytelling and the mythic nature of it and all the rest of it. And like, you can find 10,000 academics who will talk way more eloquently about that side of storytelling than me, but there are people who are doing this as their PhD about this is, this is what's happened to storytelling and it's all in Batman and it's all in Avengers, it's all in, you know, and it's kind of been a bit done to death. But what's really interesting about that is you can take that knowledge and go, but those five ages of literature map really nicely onto the five ages of media. So you go, um, we had the oral age, or the mythical age, if you like, the oral age, the scribal age, the print age, the electric age, the digital age. What happens after that? What you fall out the bottom of digital, what's next is you end up back at the oral age, this, this sitting around a campfire telling each other stories in a way that understands and can draw from all of the other media contexts. You have not just AI, but storytelling around the campfire, not just uh, uh, blockchain, but print, but um, you know, making things with clay and, and, and physical tangible things and you know, all of the tools at our disposal. We can transcend that whole discussion now. We are no longer immersed in the electric era or the digital era or the, you know, the print era, whatever it is. We can stand back from the whole thing and go, I'll have that, I'll have that, and I'll have that, and this is what I'm going to put into the world. And I think that's a really, really interesting possibility. And I think for me, that's my, my hope is, and you can call me a you know, blind optimist or whatever, my hope is that's the reversal impact of AI. AI looks like it's about the end of the world, it's about stealing all our jobs, it's about making humans redundant. I'm hoping it's about transcendence and not in the way that it's meant in the there's a film called Transcendence with Johnny Depp in it, which is about the singularity, about human and computer you know, coming together. I think the opposite of that, about human beings actually standing outside of the technology and going, you know what, I'm having all of that, and I'm using all of that as well, and this is what I've got, and that suddenly making a credible value for people and connecting with other human beings. I think the possibility of that is really super exciting. Do I think that's going to be completely unproblematic without political or economic or, you know, uh, corrupt? No, of course not. People are awful. Um, you know, and, and all of these things that, like you say, everything that makes possible an amazing amount of good things also makes possible an amazing amount of terrible things. Um, but I am encouraged by the fact that despite the technology that looked like I grew up in the, the 70s and 80s, and the 80s particularly was scary. Uh, I, I don't know if anybody here is old enough to remember what it felt like knowing that at any moment the whole world was going to be in a nuclear catastrophe. You know, that, to, to a large extent, that didn't happen. And our, you know, the better angels of our nature came to the rescue or, or something like that. We have not yet had a global nuclear catastrophe. Um, and we've had the technology and the, the you know, the will to do that for a hell of a long time, 40 years easily. Um, and that hasn't happened yet, which makes me a little bit optimistic that, because again, I think that the, the perils of technology are the amplification of humans rather than things that are inherent to the technology themselves. I think people are a problem. So yeah, I, I think that's, that's where I come down on this, but yeah, please. <laughs> <laughs> but but the fact that we're still on this planet and not you know an irradiated charred mess on the ground is I find that encouraging. Yeah, I, I think too much emphasis on this conversation is on what's possible and not what what we want to do yeah. as humans. And the, a while ago, I was going to give the example of the nuclear uh, problem, and it, it could have happened. It didn't happen. Yeah. But we don't have to be so in a simpler way. Like two years ago, we were all talking during the pandemic that over the future, we are going to be everyone on their computers. No, everyone is going to work from home. We got it. Uh, you don't have to spend money on cars, on, on fuel. Yeah. Just look outside. Yeah. Everyone is on the street. Uh, you, could be, you could be in Sweden now mm -hmm. talking to us, and we're here. Yeah. So it, it's, it still is up to us. Yeah. We still are the, the ones that decide. Yeah. I mentioned earlier on there was this um, dual keynote speech that I did with a guy who, who called himself a futurist. And one of the biggest problems I had with his speech 
was this phrase that kept coming up, in the future we will all. And I thought, in the future we won't all anything. Like, no, we have never all anything. No, it is not, you know, in the future we will all use Facebook currency, in the future we will all, you know, stream music, we will all exploit. No, we won't. No, I'll be different from you, you'll be different from me, and, and you'll do different stuff, and I'll think that's either interesting or, or bizarre or whatever. There will be main ways in which we have a lot of things in common, and again, it's about the, the you know, the um, technological environment far more than it's about, you know, the, sp the interesting thing about how we communicate today is not what we say, but the means in which we do it. The, the thing, the fact that it's digital has a much bigger impact on our society than anything that we transmit through this digital medium. Um, it's, it's the classic McLuhan thing, the medium is the message. It's like, the, you know, that is the bit that we need to pay attention to, the fact that this is how we are doing these things. That is what is informing society. Um, but, uh, but it's never going to be uniform. It's never going to be, you know, like you say, we can do all of these things. What we choose to do is, is you know, completely different. I could well have chosen not to come here and say, you know, okay, this is, this is an absolute you know, ecological catastrophe that we're talking about, and you know, I could just be in front of you on a screen and say exactly these same things. I feel like that would have less value to me, as, and I hope less value to you. Um, equally, I could have recorded everything that I said today and, and put it through ChatGPT and sent you the summary and you know, be done with it, and you know what I think now. Um, but I think what I think and who is doing the thinking is kind of uh, an interesting... Now, we'd never come across the fact that we actually know a lot of the same people in, in India, um, which is bonkers. That's, that's really crazy. But it's a really, that's a really cool thing that happened to me today. Um, uh, and, yeah, I, I, I think there's, there's value in using technology and not using technology, and I think that we, we'll juggle those ratios till the cows come home. Um, I think probably a good place to pause um, and have a short break before we get into sort of the final stretch of here's some useful stuff that you can use. Cool. Yeah? Want to have a... Is there coffee still? In my mind, this is magic. This is where I think AI comes into its own. And I don't think, um, fingers crossed, I'm not going to get you into any trouble on the copyright perspective. I don't think there is a problem with that in this. Um, but this is literally what the difference is. I don't know if you can. I'm in a conference room with the window open, and it's pretty echoey in here, too. Not the best place to record audio, yet with can we turn enhanced it up a little speech. Bit? All of the background noise and echo is gone, as if I recorded this in a professional studio. Oh, sorry. Turn off my mic and turn the... I'm in a conference room with the window open, and it's pretty echoey in here, too. Not the best place to record audio. Yet, with enhanced speech, all of the background noise and echo is gone as if I recorded this in a professional studio. Yeah, it, 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 it does a whole lot of things automatically. It actually adjusts. There, there is, it's interesting, there are some accents it doesn't deal with very well. Um, if you have British English or American English accent, then it will do phenomenal results on even if your microphone is in a completely different room. Um, but uh, we have saved a lot of video recordings of conference presentations and stuff like that by using that. And to me, uh, put that inside, I mean, this is an Adobe product, put that inside Adobe Audition, and uh, I am a very happy bunny because um, I use Adobe Audition for um, editing all the time. But in the meantime, there is a, there is a 
a, a link to, if that's useful to you, that's absolutely useful to me. Um, to be honest with you, I don't know if it will make your but it works with all vocal mic. Sorry, just going to interrupt you a second. Yeah. So please, guys, all really use the mic when you are asking questions or because we have a few viewers. They're not a lot of them, but they're great. But they're quality and viewers. Yeah, they're yeah. <laughs> and yeah. they are also interested in what you guys have to say. Yeah. Uh, so probably more it. so than they are interested in what I have to <laughs> say. So. This, this, uh, this tool, uh, the kind of results, uh, it works w with all kinds of, of noise uh, or... To varying degrees, but, uh, but rooms, like if you've got, if the microphone is too far away, yes. it solves that problem. Okay. And it sounds f phenomenal. I'm really, I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm doing an ad for Adobe here. <laughs> um, this is a free product that they put online. You upload a file, you download a file. Um, it's really inconvenient uh, as an interface, but it's if you magic. have distortions in the in the signal in the mix it. All I can suggest is that you try it. It has helped me with a lot of things. What I quite often end up doing is I will mix the original source with the AI uh, enhanced mm -hmm. and find a balance between them where I'm getting a little bit of room noise and some of the um, like the consonants that it sometimes rounds off in the AI thing, you can you can mix those things together and find a balance that you're really happy with. But yeah, I think uh, this is this is one of those things. I don't think this is taking away from anybody's creativity. I don't think it's taking anybody's job. I think it's just doing it's it's making the thing that I make better. I was uh, uh, asking because this this signal uh, the 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 voice has a nice nice. Uh, a clean, clean. It has the back background noise inherent mm. to the room, inherent to the, the the open space, the noise floor from outside. But the the signal of the the voice is not recorded with this with distortion. Mm. Uh, and when the the the, the, um, the primary signal has distortion, that's really difficult to. Oh yeah. To, to, yeah, yeah. To yeah take absolutely. That noise, not yeah. That, yeah. yeah. It's like taking the milk out of the tea, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's not easy to do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. This, okay, so another thing I wanted to show you. This is uh, something that was, I can't remember the first time, I think it was in Frankfurt at MTF, um, this was first shown. So uh, Databots is uh, two guys uh, in Chicago. Uh, one of them, a guy called CJ Carr, who's been to MTF quite a number of times. Um, and he's really interested, or they're both really interested, but he's really interested in a couple of things. One is um, uh, neural networks. He's a, an AI programmer. And the other one is extreme music of all sorts of various types. He likes, you know, free jazz. He likes uh, death metal. He likes, you know, all sorts of things. But he thinks that... Um, uh, extreme music and AI go together really, really well. So he he was the one, I don't know if you remember at the beginning, there was uh, the, the trackathon with Graham Massey from 808 State, um, and uh, he got these students using uh, vocal samples that had been generated by an AI based on training around Russian folk singing. And they sounded like human vocals, but they weren't human vocals, or any words that we knew. They just, it sounded like, you know, this particular style of singing um, and that's what he does he, he, t he gets an AI to listen to different types of music and and then try to generate that and again it's, it's this whole thing how AI works guess the next word but in this case the next word is a you know is you get 44,100 words per you know per second um, and what is the most likely thing so he's he's done um, uh, generative Nirvana. Uh, he's done generative Beatles. He's done, you know, uh, and they sound like those artists, but they don't sound like songs, and they don't sound like human words. They just sound like those musicians playing that music and that singing. And and this um, and there's a lot of people who have done really, really brilliant, um, you know, whole songs. Like for instance, there's a great uh, recording of. Uh, this Paul McCartney recorded a song when he was 71, and somebody used AI to replace 
old Paul McCartney with young Paul McCartney? And what would that sound like? And then what, what happens if John Lennon also joined him on the vocals on that? So that was kind of an interesting thing to do. And again, it was that sort of vocal modeling thing of the voice track was there and we've replaced it with something that sounds like X, Y, Z. That's not what this is. Uh, Relentless Doppelganger, which was this, it's a live stream that has been going 24 uh, seven, nonstop since September the 4th, 2019. This is a live stream that is always on and it is, uh, hopefully this isn't gonna be too loud. I don't know what your tolerance for that sort of music is, but uh, <laughs> but you you but you can have this perpetually for as as long as YouTube is around. It's basically going to be there forever, and it is never. Go it's like stepping into a stream. You're not stepping into the same stream twice, right? It's always going to be different um, because it is generative. Now, this idea of generative music isn't new. Um, Brian Eno's been talking about this for a very very long time, and what he wants to create, or well, at least he said he wants to create, and this is easily 15 years, um, is a machine that approaches music in the way that he approaches music. He said, I don't, want to, I don't want to compose for it, I want to teach it how I think about music and then let it do it. Uh, and so it will always come up with surprise, it will always come up with you know, things, but it will always sound like it's from you know, the, the Brian Eno musical universe. You know, um, which I think is a, is a really interesting thing. And, and again, you can step back into this. Okay, so there are no vocals in there, but there's sound, something that sounds like vocals. It's trained on this kind of music. Um, and there is no there is no copyright problem in this because this is just being generated by a machine and you know you can have that and, and go on as long as you like. I really like that as an idea because in a, in, a, in a number of ways. One is it's thinking about music in a particular way. This ticks all the boxes for, for a lot of people who like a lot of this stuff, right? This is just doing extreme noise and I like extreme noise and that's really cool, turn it up. Um, I'm not here for the emotion, I'm not here for the human connection, I'm not here for the lyrics, I'm not here for the meaning, I just want the energy. That's really what I'm, and this is why this works really well. Um, but also, it's a toy, right? This is a, this, everybody here, to one degree or another, smiled or laughed when that came on, because it's fun, and it's funny, and it's, um, you know, and I think that one of the cool things to do with the technology is make us laugh with it. Not because that's the end result, but that this playfulness, and again, this, this comes back to what we do at MTF, having playfulness at the edges of what's possible with the technology leads you to discovery uh, and leads you to ways in which you can find out new stuff. It's why Sgt. Pepper is such an amazingly important album, is because they're going, yeah, but what else can this do? Yeah, but what else can that do? Yeah, but what if we, do, what if we try this? What if we try that? And almost like a game. Like they didn't go in there with a recipe for the here is how we're going to do this. They played with the studio equipment just to see what else they could make it do. And and came up with, you know, what is generally recognized as a masterpiece as a result of that. It's not my favorite record in the world, but I think it's a really important one. Um, and, and for all those sorts of reasons. So anyway, there is that. Um, we talked a little bit about uh, NFTs. Um, we were just discussing, you know, the uh, the possibility of, you know, what an NFT enables, and I like I have a slightly complicated relationship with NFTs um, uh, and uh, cryptocurrency. I own some cryptocurrency. Um, I don't speculate with cryptocurrency, but I was once paid in cryptocurrency, and it's still sitting there, um, and uh, it's not worth anything like it, what it was when I was paid it. 
and I don't expect it ever will be again. Um, that's just you know the nature of the beast. Uh, it's not any of the cryptocurrencies you've probably heard of, so there is that. Um, but also, I've been involved with the, the publication of an NFT, which was um, music adjacent. Uh, it was a photograph of a musical artist that was then animated. Um, and so it was, and the reason I was involved is that we had paid for the photograph to be taken for a promotion around Music Tech Fest. Um, and so that conversation, initiated by the artist, can we use this photo for an NFT, um, involved us because we had the rights to the, the uh, photograph, but also it involved the photographer because we thought that was you know, an important and correct thing to do, and it involved the animator. So it was a sort of this four-way conversation. Now, my understanding of what happened with that NFT sale, and we got some money out of it, it sold for more than a photograph of an artist normally sells for, but less than an NFT usually sells for. Um, and the artist ended up making some money, and the photographer ended up making some money, and we ended up making some money. Maybe enough to go and have a dinner, um, which is cool. Um, and so I'm, I'm not, you know, if there was sort of metaphorical blood on anyone's hands, then mine would be included because I was involved in that. I think that NFTs and cryptocurrency are massively problematic uh, at the macro scale. And I, I, and I don't think that has anything to do with the artists. I think it, I, I am in favor of most things that artists can leverage in order to make being an artist a, a sustainable thing. Um, but I think that there, there are both corrupt people involved in that at, at a very high level. Um, and usually it's people who set up currency exchanges, uh, um, uh, cryptocurrency banks, uh, cryptocurrencies themselves. Some of the, sometimes that, um, uh, that corruption isn't a kind of evil, if you like, but it's just, it's from not thinking about the social repercussion, uh, repercussions of technological development. Um, and I think that's a problem with a lot of technologies that people sort of, code things in a particular way because that's how they think the code should work without thinking about the social aspects of it. I will refer back to the, you know, the driverless vehicles that are really good at recognizing when a white pedestrian is crossing the road in front of the car, but not much else. Um, I, so I think that these things are sort of baked into those technologies. And there is a really, and this is what Line Goes Up uh, is about, there's a really phenomenal Canadian documentary. That is the YouTube link. That's the QR code if you want to grab it and watch it later, although feel free to just you know, email me and I'll send it to you. Um, it's two hours and 20 minutes of your life, um, but I think it's really well spent. Um, I'll take you through the main points real quick, though. Um, or you could just Google Line Goes Up documentary, um, and that will talk you through the mechanics of what's wrong with NFTs, what's wrong with cryptocurrency. Um, under ordinary circumstances, I would just play you an excerpt from it, uh, but uh, we are live streaming this, and so that introduces uh, copyright complexities, so hence the QR code, but also the main points. Uh, I thought I would just summarize the main points of the documentary for you. It's a Canadian documentary. It came out last year. It's about the problem with NFTs. It's about the idea of digital ownership. It's about scarcity. It talks about the history of what's known as Web 3.0, which is you know one of those terms that you could question. Um, through t the 2008 recession, which is kind of really important when it comes to this, um, through to the present day. But basically, cryptocurrency is a scheme to get more people into cryptocurrency. It's, it's, a, it's a pyramid scheme or a multi-level marketing scheme in that you make money by getting in early and getting other people on board so that it creates more value for you. Uh, and at some point, the last people in are going to lose everything. That's basically how it works. Um, it's quite critical about a lot of the low quality art that is uh, traded on um, as NFTs. Uh, people aren't buying the art because of the art, they're buying art because of the NFTs. And so the actual, um, it's, like, it's like buying a record because you want to display the receipt. That's essentially it. Uh, and, and there is a, a kind of a, quite a toxic uh, um, 
what would you say, uh, game of prestige, I guess, about, you know, I own this really, really ugly cartoon of an ape who's wearing a hat backwards and is missing a tooth. You know, fine, but the, the, the flex is I spent $200,000 on it, not isn't this $200,000 worth of art. Um, there are a lot of um, what they call blockchain games, which are mostly terrible games, but um, the idea is that you play them to earn cryptocurrency. And so essentially the, the players become the engine for the currency to generate value. Um, and uh, basically this, the, you know, the takeaway is that NFTs and cryptocurrency are kind of the latest evolution. They're at the cutting edge of fraud. Um, and those people who are setting them up and running them essentially, you know, basically the, the idea is if you are in charge of a cryptocurrency or a platform for NFTs, however you want to slice it, you are engaged in the activity of fraud. Um, and I think that's a really interesting conclusion. I have to say, I'm convinced by this documentary, but I don't think it's the whole story. And again, it goes back to that whole thing of, um, there are, I know quite a few artists who are doing stuff with NFTs that is really phenomenal, particularly conceptually, art. Um, there's uh, one you might want to search, uh, which is called Vocal Gems, uh, which is um, basically gems created in virtual space based on the voice print of a human being. So every, every human voice is different. They're thought of as jewels, essentially. And so somebody speaking or singing can computer generate a, a particular gem format. And, and you, know, you could search that. But they've created, you can buy these gems, or you can have them created of your voice, or they might be of a famous person, and so on. And you can go through a three-dimensional gallery of these gems and see how they've been created and what are the you know, characteristics of them. And it's, it's really kind of, it's interesting and it's nice. I think it's, it's more conceptually successful than it is, to me, aesthetically successful. Um, but it, it, it operates in this domain of NFTs and, and so on. And, you know, I'm, I'm reluctant to, you know, take away from the, the artistic or even commercial merit of that just because the mechanism, honestly, I think um, you could have a lot of criticisms about money in the same way, the way money works. That's just as imaginary to a large extent as anything else. So I think there are trade-offs anyway. So I wanted to bring that. Uh, Relentless Doppelganger, we did. That was the Databots thing. Here's another film that I think is absolutely worth your time. It's more of a presentation than a film, but it's an hour long and it's somebody else's work and I don't want to show it to you because um, you know that would, um, again, be problematic from a copyright perspective. But I do encourage you to check it out. Uh, you, again, you can just Google the AI dilemma. What's really interesting about this is this came out probably a month ago, would be my guess. I think four weeks is probably about right. And you would not believe how much has happened between that presentation and today. One of the hardest things about preparing for this masterclass, because, uh, you know, I like to take these things seriously and I, you know, I'm being invited to come on as the expert and all these things and you know, basically I'm this old dude who really doesn't know so much about this. Um, I want to be as on top of it as I possibly can. So I need to read everything, I need to follow everything, I need to be up to date, what's the latest news on it, you know, follow all the RSS feeds, watch all the videos. Literally every day there are videos going, oh my God, guys, you will not believe what's just happened in the world of AI. It's now this. Um, and it, it's, it's exhausting, frankly. Um, it is moving at a phenomenal rate, which is both really exciting and really terrifying in all sorts of ways. Um, when this speech came out, ChatGPT was not on mobile phones other than through a browser. Uh, now there is an app you can download. Uh, it was not connecting to the internet. It was based on training data before, I think, 2021? Uh, 2020 even, possibly. But uh, now uh, BARD has come out, which is Google's version. Uh, that's just in the last week and a half, two weeks. 
Um, and that is fundamentally connected to the internet. And so ChatGPT is fundamentally. It's an arms race, basically. Um, if anybody makes an advance here, then everybody has to make that advance there. Um, so that's been really interesting. But the AI dilemma basically makes the case of the speed of development should be the thing that frightens us. And there are a lot of things that we need to put in place before we just dive headfirst into things. And, and more from the point of view of the people who make decisions about what's acceptable in the world of AI might not necessarily be these technology companies. Um, this might be a good place for informed legislation to say this is what you're allowed to do, this is what you're not allowed to do. Fortunately, where we are sitting, uh, the example of best practice that keeps getting pointed to is we should do what the EU are doing. We should do what the EU are doing. The EU is actually taking this seriously. They are making legislation that is about, like for instance, there is a, there's a three-tier uh, way of thinking about AI within the European Union. There is high-risk stuff, let's say medical, financial, uh, personal data, that's the medium-risk stuff, and there's low-risk stuff. And you can argue all day about which should be in that category, but I would say making death metal and streaming it online is probably fairly low risk. Um, it's difficult to think of a scenario in which that is dangerous to anybody in terms of their health or livelihoods or you know, whatever it might be. Um, but you can think of all sorts of examples where you know, driverless vehicles, for instance, people's lives are in danger. You know, um, uh, we should have legislation around um, uh, medical diagnosis, you know. Uh, if an AI is going to declare you have cancer, I think that's phenomenal that it can, but I'd quite like a doctor to also have a look at the data and, you know, um, you know I think that's, that's not uh, an unreasonable request. Um, not that doctors are infallible either, but, um, yeah, um, there's, there's a... There's a really interesting statistic that is, is uh, touted in that, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll go to the main points. Half, they, this is according to the documentary, or the, the presentation, half of AI researchers currently working today believe there is a 10% or greater chance that humans will go extinct from their inability to control AI. And the analogy they use is, imagine if you got on a plane and half of aircraft engineers thought there was a greater than 10% chance that everybody on that plane was going to die. Would you stay on that plane or would you get off that plane? Um, and, and that's the way that they frame that. Now, what's interesting is there's been a lot of talk since then where people say, I know a lot of AI researchers and not one of them think there is a, anything chance of AI causing extinction. So this is just a thing that they say. It isn't a, necessarily a proven fact. But it's an interesting statistic anyway. Um, they talk about humanity's first contact moment in the, in the sort of the sci-fi meeting the aliens perspective, but was with social media. And look how that went. Um, basically, democracy fell as a result of uh, human beings uh, interacting via um, the algorithms on social media, how the, the algorithms shaped how we respond to things because we like likes and we get likes through outrage and outrage is what has, has ended up driving social media. It's that you know reversal thing that we talked about before where Facebook became about dividing people, not bringing them together. Um, one of their main points is that uh, guardrails that you might assume exist with, uh, with things like this technology actually don't. Um, so things that you think, well, you know, of course they're going to have put that in there because that would be ridiculous if they hadn't. They haven't. Um, whoever the they might be, uh, and normally that's the, sort of the, the developers. But again, I would remind that, that when we're talking about technologies, these are not, technologies don't have agency necessarily. They don't, they're, not, they're not doing the deciding about how they work. Human beings are, having the deci are doing the deciding about how they work. Uh, human beings are both mostly pretty great, uh, but also can be terrible. Um, and we need to bear both of those things in mind. Um, and also, the, one of the arguments is that the media hasn't been covering the AI advances in a way that allows you to truly see what's at stake. Because again, 
uh, what sells newspapers is fear. What sells uh, TV shows is outrage. What sells, you know, so they're going to go, uh, first of all, they're going to go, uh, the thing that I just read to you in my last news item was actually written by ChatGPT. And let me tell you about how this is changing the whole world of X, Y, and Z. You might lose your job and you know, all the rest of it. And, uh, and you see that kind of reporting a lot. Um, but it doesn't actually cover what's going on in the world of AI, what's possible in AI, what the, you know, the things that I've shown you that, you know, like the enhancing speech from Adobe or the relentless doppelgangers or the, you know, the, the summarizing your points as I went around the table and, uh, and, you know, raising questions from them. I think those are all good things. And those things are not interesting enough to be put in the news. Um, what's interesting enough to be put in the news is Tesla's being recalled because they're killing people. You know? so. Exactly, yeah. Um, and it's right that if Tesla self-driving vehicles kill people, that that should be in the news. People should know that this is a thing. But um, here is, now the, the reason I have included this one, um, this is an interesting video. This is called Five AI, AI Tools That Have Saved Me 100 Plus Hours. And it's 17 minutes and 42 seconds. That's a title that makes me want to watch that video. Um, uh, and actually, I ended up subscribing to this woman's channel because I think she's really great. Um, but it's an example of something that gets onto YouTube daily, hundreds of hundreds of them saying, here are these amazing AI tools. That, Did you know you could do this with AI? Did you know you could do that with AI? Uh, there's a bunch of people I follow, or I'm on email lists, or I, you know, um, subscribe to on YouTube, who are going, and now this, and now this, and now this, and there's more things. Um, and they all have titles like, you know, here are five AI, AI tools that can make you a fortune, or save you thousands of hours, or all the rest of it. This one is, is one of the less um, hysterical of them. Um, and she's a, a video maker, and uh, this is the one, I, I told you about the um, Autopod plugin. Um, that automatically edits the video of who's talking and the rest of it. That's where I got this from. Um, she uses it a lot. Um, but the main takeaways from this is automatic subtitles in Resolve and Premiere Pro. If anybody works in video, if you're editing and you use, like I use Premiere Pro, she's a really big fan of Resolve, um, but there are in both of them now uh, automatic subtitling. Uh, it can take a transcription of what's being saying and put the subtitles on the videos for you. So you don't have to type them in on YouTube or you know, add them. Um, Text-based video editing, because it's doing the transcript, you can say, this piece of text, that piece of text, cut out that bit of text, and it will edit the video based on what people had said. And you can just go, that's the edit. It's not at that particular point in the timeline. It's when they said, hello and welcome to the show, cut there, remove the next sentence, carry on from there. You just delete the text, and it does the editing of the video. That, to me, would save a lot of time. Now, that's not going to give you your finished edit, but it's going to get you 90% of the way there. Uh, there's a thing in, uh, in Resolve called relighting. So you can actually put a point source light anywhere in the frame, and it will light the person in the frame from there. You sort of identify this as the subject, and that's where the light should be, and it can you know, relight your, your frame for you, which is cool. She talks a lot about the application of AI within software that you already use. That's the real takeaway point here for me, is that all of these AI tools, like Notion that I showed you before, um, these are being integrated into stuff that is already part of your existing workflows. And I think that, that that's an interesting thing. That's a helpful thing. Uh, more helpful than now I need to upload my video file to this web interface and then download the result from that. Um, uh, she talks a little bit about AI hallucinations, and she also talks about using Notion AI for writing web copy, which, you know, great, that saves time. If I'm not, I've never been 100% happy with anything that um, ChatGPT or Notion AI or any of these things have come up with in terms of text. I am a writer, I like to write. I'm not the best writer in the world, but I'm better than ChatGPT. Uh, and so what it might do is take away the, the blank page uh, writer's block thing but you are always going to work on the thing that it generates. If you're, if you're happy with what it generates, then, yeah, you're, you know, your quality <laughs> control is probably, you know, lacking, I would say. Um, so 
there is another video that has been doing the rounds, particularly in the music sphere. Um, has anybody come across Rick Beato? Um, yeah, so he does a lot of uh, quite good videos if you're into rock music, if you're into um, bands, if you're into uh, musicology. Uh, he, and he basically talks through what, what makes this song so great is one of his kind of regular things that he does. And he'll go like, you know, Roxanne by the Police, what's amazing about that? Oh, look, it's using, you know, major ninth diminished chords. I don't know. You know the, my musicology kind of runs out there. But, but it's that sort of analysis of things. But he talks about AI and its consequences. There is the QR code if you want to grab that one. Um, and like he's doing it from the point of view of, I am a musician, I am a studio engineer. This is what I think AI means for people like me. Um, and so he's probably more of an authority on that side of things than I am ever going to be for you. And if that's useful, that's him there. Uh, but his takeaways are um, that whole thing about universal music taking down by the copyright thing on, on Drake's voice. Um, it raises the question, you know, who has the copyright on something that sounds like Drake? Um, well, yeah, yeah that, that's kind of his point. Um, he plays uh, this uh, a fake Liam Gallagher AI interpretation, but with a real band. So real musicians, like AISIS. Um, and it's a song that's been composed. It isn't, a, it isn't an Oasis song. It's, a, you know, it's this band, but it sounds like a Gallagher doing the vocals. And it sounds like in the style of Oasis, but it's, never, it's, it's no music that they had ever played before. But it is real musicians playing real musical instruments, a real singer whose vocal guide has been replaced by something that the AI has generated. Um, and this guy, Roberto Nixon, uh, who is a, a YouTuber, who basically shows you how to do that. Uh, so he walks you through the process of, this is how I replace the voice on this, you know, using this. Um, uh, he talks about the Winter's Cold video, which is the Drake song that isn't Drake, that is actually a good song for people who like Drake. Um, uh, and there's also a version of uh, Black Hole Sun, but with Kurt Cobain on vocals. So it's the actual, the original musical track, but the vocalist replaced. And it's okay. It's all right. Um, there's the young Paul McCartney thing. But he talks about like the, the catastrophic impact. Well, not catastrophic. That's the wrong word. The massive seismic impact that Napster had on the music industries in 1999. That's what's happening now in AI. Everybody's just basically in free fall. What the hell do we do about this? How do we stop this? How do we make this go away? How do we, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we've been through this before. Um, I'm going to return to that point in a bit because we've got a little bit left, uh, time left to talk about this. But I think that's really important. What the music industry did in 1999 and what the music industry has done since then are really interesting models for what is happening with AI from a music perspective. Um, but he also talks about how older tech dropped in price when everybody started using Pro Tools. So he bought himself this you know, two-inch 24-track uh, machine that uh, he got at a bargain. Um, he's talking about uh, you know, basically apps and plugins that replace really heavy amps and pedals and equipment and all the rest of it. Um, and auto-tune. Auto-tune came in. Everybody complained. Like, Cher did something kind of interesting with it, and then it just got done to death. Auto-tune has not gone away. It's still not going to go away. People are still going to use it. A lot of the time, I think it's good that they use it. Um, <laughs> and I think it's helpful in a lot of respects. You know, I think there are, you know, it's, it's not going to stop people from being good at singing, but it's going to take the edge off people who are almost good at singing but just miss a little bit, you can tweak it. And I think that's, that's absolutely cool and fine. Um, but tech doesn't go away, is his point. You know, you introduce, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to put the snakes back in the box. You're not going to take the milk out of the tea. Um, it's there now. How are we going to respond to it as artists? How are we going to respond to it as, as um, you know, uh, music technologists, as audiences? You know, what are we going to do about it? Um, he says that basically, the, you know, this, as always happens with these technologies, those people who already have the power are going to already have the power and are going to continue to have the power. 
I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, I think when you read about the music industry, what you think is the record labels, the major record labels particularly. And I've said for a long time, call, the major record labels calling themselves the music industry is a bit like the lions calling themselves the zoo, right? You know, they might be the, the loudest bit with the sharpest teeth, but they are not the most interesting thing going on, and they're certainly not the only game in town. Music industries are really complex and diverse, and there's lots of people doing lots of interesting stuff. You know, I'm going to go look at the penguins. Um, and that's kind of my, my approach to this. And so, but, but if you want to see where is the music industry, before the age of recording, before the electric age, if you like, which is sort of recordings and broadcasting, um, publishers, you know, dots on paper was the music industry. Uh, and you would go to the shop and you would buy a piece of paper with dots on it. You would take it home and you would play it in the piano in the parlor, probably quite badly. And you'd have a sing-along with your friends. That was the music industry, right? The music industry was the publishing. Um, and then it was the recording when the technology changed. And then, I would argue, it's already changed again. You know, And you just need to look at where all the money is. Who's making all the money out of music? It isn't the record companies. And, and it was never the artists. Um, but the technology companies, you know, digital technology companies who are, you know, the Spotify's of the world, the, you know, those sorts of organizations, but even Google, you know, Google makes, I mean, Google had a meeting with um, the major record labels about how Google links to music, how YouTube uh, needs to pay rights to the record labels. And the record labels were there on the other side of the table from the Google guys. A and, you know, um, negotiating as equals. Um, and one technology journalist made the observation that the people on the Google side of the table, like the, the, the heads of Google, the founders of Google, they could buy those record labels with the change they found down the back of the sofa. Right? That's the scale that we're talking about. That, you know, that is economically, you are pennies to our dollars. Um, but they had that conversation because that wasn't the game they wanted to be in. Nobody in their right minds wants to be in the recorded music business. Um, which is why you find a lot of people who are not in their right minds who are in the recorded music business. At least as a way of making a lot of money. Because it just isn't. It's not why you do it. Um, there are people who make money from, you know, don't get me wrong, there are, you know, these lottery winners and outliers. <coughs> but there was a really good example of, you know, a few years back, um, there was a lot of talk, uh, the Recording Industry Association, or it's actually, no, the BPI, the British Phonographic Institute. Uh, when, this is a landmark year for recorded music in Britain. We have never made this much money from recorded music in Britain. And you stay, take one step back from it, you go, no, Adele put out a record. That's what happened. This is not the British recording industry had a good year. This is Adele put out a record. That's what the difference was. And, and so there are these massive outliers who absolutely change our perception of you know, how the industry is doing. Um, but actually, I think there's a lot more interesting stuff. I think it's a lot more diverse. I think it's a lot more complicated, and I think that technology has a role in that. But anyway, um, I, the music, in, the record labels are not the music industry. Is my point? That you know, and they haven't been for quite a while, um, but they will keep claiming to be so. Spotify. Spotify is certainly a big part of it. But okay, so those are some links that I thought were kind of interesting to discuss and. Uh, and also sort of further reading to go down. But um, there was something that I wanted to return to. And I'm struggling to think what that was. Does anybody want to rewind and remind me? Um, <laughs> sorry? No, it wasn't the data bots. Uh, it was... I think, I think in future, when we're having a conversation, one of us needs to be listening. <laughs> um, uh, no, I did that, I did that, I did that. Uh, social media, I did that, I did. The tech giants? 
music industry? Yeah, I think there's, I mean, there's lots to say about all of that stuff. I, I, I mean, I guess, I, I come back to this whole thing about what you want to get out of this. You know, I've shown you some, some tools, I've shown you some, you know, we've had some discussions about some of the things about, I, we, I tell you what we haven't talked about, which is interesting because it's the name of this whole session, is this idea of metaverse. Um, and if you Google metaverse now, what you will find is articles about the death of the metaverse. Uh, and wow, that didn't even become a thing before it became not a thing, right? Um, and uh, a lot of it talks about meta, the, the, you know, what was Facebook, and uh, Mark Zuckerberg's big investment into this idea that we're all going to basically inhabit this virtual world from here on out, and we're going to, you know, um, join rooms and play games together and, you know, hang out and socialize in, in virtual space, and you'll all be wearing, it won't be helmets necessarily, but goggles and, and then glasses and then maybe, you know, I don't know, contact lenses or whatever it might be. But, um, and it got as far as, well, we can have avatars in this space, but we haven't worked out legs yet. Um, so none of the avatars in the, the Facebook meta universe uh, actually, you know, they're basically floating, you know, weebles or whatever you want to think of them as. Um, but there's no, like this is the phrase goes, there's no there there. You know, people go there and go, okay, so how's it going with you? Um, but we've had that for a long time. I mean, Second Life, any of you familiar with? Second Life was exactly that, and in and, and quite a sophisticated way, because it had a, a build environment involved in there. I have a friend who's a New Zealander who lives in Britain, uh, who made a living for a number of years performing concerts in Second Life, um, which is, you know, probably more than anybody can say for, you know, the metaverse, in inverted commas. Um, but there isn't a death of the metaverse either, I would argue. I don't, I don't think it became the overwhelming thing that, you know, billions of dollars was hoping it was going to be. But it's this, you know, adjusting of ratios. We've had immersive media for a hell of a long time. Um, one of the guys who came to MTF and did a showcase, um, a guy called Charlie, uh, has been doing immersive media. Put it this way, he's been doing immersive media long enough that... Uh, he was involved in the documentary the year after the moon landing. Like, so he, he got all the footage from NASA and he was involved in the found sound soundtrack to NASA's own documentary about the moon landing that came out the year after the moon landing. So he's, you know, he's an older gentleman. He's been around for a while and he's been working in immersive media and immersive performances and immersive technology since then to today. Um, so this, this idea of uh, immersion as a way of experiencing, particularly music, is not new. I mean, quadraphonic is, is an immersive technology. Um, and, you know, that came and went and was fine. And, you know, and now we have, you know, surround sound and, you know, DTS and 7.1 or, you know, all sorts of, you know, Atmos, Atmos Adobe Atmos and... Ambisonics, yeah. Um, there's there's all sorts of uh, approaches to this, and and you know um, virtual reality. I did a you know I think for my masters uh, in 2001, which was kind of about the history of virtual reality, and that goes back a long way. Um, so yeah, I mean this is this is nothing new, and I don't think it's going away either. I just don't think it's going to be the big thing that everybody, well, not that everybody, but that some people bet a lot of money that it was going to be. So, you know, you can do musical stuff with VR, with AR, particularly with gaming. And I think that, that gaming is a, is a really interesting thing. And I, I mentioned before I had some involvement with Bandcamp, uh, which you presumably know kind of what Bandcamp is. It's basically an a online platform where you can sell your music. And they take a cut and you get the rest and they do all the e-commerce and the download platform and all the rest of it. Um, but Bandcamp 
sort of about halfway through last year, uh, was sold to Epic Games, which I think is really interesting uh, for a number of reasons. Epic Games, uh, among other things, um, published Fortnite, which is probably, if not the biggest game, uh, it is certainly the f fastest revenue generating game you know, out there. Um, they basically don't know what to do with all the money. Um, because Epic Games is owned by one guy. Um, and, and that guy is like, I literally cannot spend this money fast enough. Um, but one of the things I like about Epic Games is, and this is why it was a good match for Bandcamp, is they're really interested in what can the creators do in this environment with this technology. And Epic Games aren't going to touch Bandcamp for now, other than put some more resources into it. So, like, for instance, um, I think uh, the editorial has already massively increased. Like, they basically put more money into people writing interesting things about music, like really quality writing that brings more artists to more people's attention. I think it's phenomenal. I think that um, uh, internationalization is a really good thing for it as well, so that you can not just buy music on Bandcamp, but if you have any problems or downloads, you can speak in Portuguese to somebody at Bandcamp, and not only is the website auto-translated into Portuguese, but you can actually talk to support. You know, I don't know if that's true yet, but it's certainly something that they could you know, invest resources into. But the long game of it, I think the, who remembers MySpace? You know what the cool thing about MySpace was? MySpace had every freaking band on the planet. Like every single one of them, like every artist was on MySpace, and and they couldn't work out what to do with that, um, other than put ads on every pa for, for suspiciously cheap children's clothing, quite often, um, and like it was just this toxic environment owned by toxic people, and everybody left. Nobody has since had every band on the planet, um, but something like. Uh, Fortnite, or the makers of Fortnite at least, with access to most independent artists, that's a really good start. Mm. With Bandcamp, it's like, what can you do with that? You can massively provide value for them and therefore massively make money. Because the thing that I've always loved about Bandcamp, and I'm no, I'm cards on the table, I'm no longer involved with Bandcamp, I'm not on their board of advisors. It was complete change of ownership and um, the people that I worked with, I, you know, it's not a thing anymore. Um, did I just kill that? Sorry, that was me. Um, uh, but I think the thing that Bandcamp has always understood and always done well, Bandcamp makes money when they make more money for artists. And to me, that's if you're going to do business in the business world, that's a really good way to do business. And I think having that ethos brought into Epic Games in a way that basically they can't mess that up, I think it's really important. Yeah, you know, when they implemented the the Fridays where the artists would uh, get like the hundred percent was during lockdown no? yeah. because most sure. uh, musicians most artists were, were struggling. having a, a yeah. really, a really, uh, but that, that's raised uh, sales like uh, over the roof. <coughs> and I believe not only on Fridays, yeah. uh, but it created a lot of awareness uh, about the whole ecosystem of Bandcamp. Yeah. And um, they've also implemented recently the, the playlisting. That is something, yep. and they did it after Epic. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah no, that, that was something that Bandcamp without Epic was never going to do. Yeah, and yeah, um, yeah so I, you already can see changes, and uh, so far in the in a good direction. Yeah, yeah. interesting direction. Well, I mean, the the good thing is the same people are in charge. Yeah, yeah. You know, the same people are working there. The same people are, you know, it's the same boat. They're just, you know, they're floating higher now because they've got more resources. I also read something about. Um, about Epic Games using, like, in, in radios inside their games, using music from Bandcamp. Okay. Uh, artists playing at radios uh, that are... Uh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Like, yeah, like Grand Theft Auto used yeah, to yeah, do. Yeah, that's, you know? yeah, something like um, that. I, and I think, but I think there's a cultural aspect to it as well uh, as a, um, uh, as well as an economic aspect to it. So, a really good example of this. Does anybody remember the game Wipeout? Yeah. Right, right. okay. Wipeout. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. Um, now, Wipeout introduced Chemical Brothers to most people. Most people who ended up liking Chemical Brothers liked Chemical Brothers because the music was in, was in Wipeout, PlayStation, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And this whole thing of putting the music into an experience, like one of the biggest yep. sales categories in Bandcamp history was soundtracks to indie games. Because of, like, the, your favorite music in the world, typically, is whatever you were listening to when you were about 15. You know? That's the stuff that really sticks with you because that's when you were emotionally at your peak and everything that hit you hit you really hard. Um, all the stuff that was, was, you know, you fell in love for the first time or you, you know, you had your heart broken or, you know, and everything was massively meaningful to you. And so the music that, that hit you at that time was the stuff that's going to stick in your brain forever. Um, but it turns out that that same phenomenon is true when people are playing games. They're like, they're, this, is, this is the music that is happening while I'm feeling clever solving this puzzle. This is the music that's happening when I'm running away and feeling scared. No, I have a heightened emotional experience while I'm in this immersive environment. And this is the music that is accompanying that. And that music, people want to own that music. People want to pay money for that music. And, and literally, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really, for me, it's a really fascinating phenomenon that, that people are buying records, vinyl records, to soundtracks to indie games that they like. Uh, and, and that it has this kind of uh, connection. I, I think that's a really cool thing. And I think that there is a, a much more interesting overlap between the immersive world of games and music than there might be necessarily with, OK, we're all in the metaverse, now let's go to a concert. But at the same time, the DJ Marshmallow thing inside Fortnite was huge. That was a really big, that was the biggest concert there has ever been in history, as far as I'm aware. You know, millions of people attended a 20-minute gig by a guy who looks like a marshmallow playing <laughs> electronic music. Um, you know, cool, all for it. I don't think that's a recipe, right? This is one thing I, you know, and going back 20, well, nearly 20 years when I was first talking to musicians about this, um, there was a really famous internet phenomenon called the Million Dollar Homepage. Anybody ever come across this? was this uh, guy at a university um, who, you know, this is sort of early days of the web, but he made a web page and he basically did it X number of pixels by X number of pixels. There were a million pixels on a page. For a dollar a pixel, you can buy your logo on this page. So like a 10 by 10 pixel logo, $100. Um, a, a 20 by 30, $600. Um, but uh, bigger and bigger. and. Like within a week, he had sold a million dollars worth of pixels. Like, because Coke bought a big one, and then Pepsi needed to buy a bigger one, and then you know Ford and you know BMW, whatever. All these brands started going. We will buy this many pixels, and he like sold out, which is a phenomenal success story. But you know what didn't work? It's the second million dollar homepage. Somebody else came along and said, oh, "I'm going to do that too." Here's my million dollar homepage. Didn't make a cent. Because it isn't a recipe. It's about being innovative. It's about coming up with something that connects with your you know, intended audience. And that's why I think that the, the interesting thing is the sort of the human aspect of this. You know, there are all these technologies with all these affordances. But only you know what you do and what your audience likes and how you can join the dots between those things. And you can put whatever you like in that kind of conversation and set it up in a way that's going to create meaning for them. For DJ Marshmallow, an audience in Fortnite is phenomenal, but you know, Trolls Toy are not going to do so well. In in you know, a, they'll do well, but not as well uh, in that environment because that isn't your thing, right? You, you, your audience makes different meaning from music than this, and they value other things. And they, you know, um, twenty minutes of you DJing in a virtual environment. Um, you can try, yeah, but it might be the second million dollar homepage, you know. Um, so that's, yeah, uh, that's that, I guess. Um, yeah, I was going to say, are there any questions? Because we've got about 10 minutes for this. This is going to be uh, slightly disconnected, but maybe still <laughs> connected to the cool. whole thing. I think we spoke a lot about uh, creation and, uh, you know, what we create. and. But something that I was like constantly thinking about is how how we consume all of this. Yep. And uh, I feel like uh, I don't know how big uh, Instagram is a part of everyone's life, 
it it's quite big f- for me mm-hmm. but i try to not let it be but then i still feel like how people are consuming is leading them to consume shorter and shorter spans of what we call content yeah. or like it can be art or whatever but they're like and so is the speed of rejection like you know like swipe just like yeah. 10 seconds i don't like it swipe yeah. and then so how does that affect creators and like it's like and also uh on one end there are people investing in atmos mixes and like you know mm-hmm. uh, get this song mixed by the best mix uh, engineer in the world yep. or whatever and then and now you're listening to the song on the phone exactly and yeah uh and and that's that's actually good and bad because i feel it it gives the person who doesn't have any uh, money to get his song mixed uh still be like okay like at least i can hear the art in this the production and mm-hmm. so like i'm okay like lis- people are okay listening to it on the on the phone but at the same time what about the people who are spending so much time and money and to get it to a certain level and then it's being consumed in a shitty way you know or like uh, you know you've answered your own question though yeah but the, <laughs> yeah, like like because what you've said is there are people on one hand doing the atmos mixes there are people on the other hand who are basically producing albums in playstation and and putting them on mobile phones and some people are listening in this environment and some people are sitting at home with you know you know reference monitors and all the rest of it and it's complicated and some of it's good and some of it's bad and and what was your question my question was that like uh it's i think mostly it was the is the fact that uh, how we're consuming is becoming like almost like trying to cut through the noise which is uh i don't know whether that's like again no yeah i i don't know what there there is a marketing about. aspect for that i think for sure if you want to be discovered by more people or you want to be you know making more money from your music you might need a bigger audience because then you might have more you know subscribers or listeners or or purchases or or whatever that might be and so th- the cutting through is not a, a sonic thing as much as it is a marketing thing um but again coming back to trolls toy is is a really good example how many people are listening to your album on a bus through a mobile phone how many people are, are buying the vinyl and sitting at home between the two speakers me right that's i, I am your target audience that was, you. That was me yeah <laughs> um and but but that isn't relevant to the next person who is making a different kind of music um so abishek is doing uh you know electronic sound that it might sound i haven't heard your music yet but it might sound phenomenal coming out of a mobile phone at the back of the bus i don't know um that is uh, uh, communities uh, play uh, in, an important part mm-hmm. of of the role there yeah. uh, you you have people that are still buying tapes old tapes like one off inch to to listen music through tapes in in because they 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 like the tape sound and you have uh, people that only sp- that spends thousands and thousands of dollars in a, a stereo pair of speakers to be to have at home you have people that spend the same by an immersive yeah. it's it's like a community mm-hmm. and all the communities have their value in terms of the quantity of persons that are using that uh it's like we like uh, the 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 kind of style of music that we hear mm. you will choose that also that you want to listen so but it's not it's not even just communities it's also individuals like and uh, like how do you listen to music is a really interesting question because for me sometimes I am sitting down between the two speakers and putting a record on playing side one then playing side two sometimes I've just got something on in the background from Spotify while I'm doing some work and and I'm not paying attention to it at all and and you know are you going to tell me one of those is wrong or are you going to tell me that I'm I'm a bad mu- like here is a thing that that really pisses people off right that I tell people they think I'm a bad human being like I think records are better than live concerts I like them more. I would far rather listen to somebody who has really worked at getting their idealized version of this particular piece of music recorded in this particular way and and presented as a finished product than somebody who might be having an off night in a shitty venue, right? That's to me 
that's a trade-off that I would, and you know, and I don't get beer spilled on my shoes, and I, you know, I can sit comfortably, and I can, you know, all those things. The, the kind of thing that's an old dude like me will feel comfortable with, and I like that. But a lot of people say that's, you know, it's not how the artist intended, or it's not, uh, you know, it's not the real, authentic experience, the rest of it. It's like, don't tell me how to enjoy music. Um, and, and I can go to concerts and really enjoy them, but, yeah. I don't, I don't know it. If this, uh, I, I don't know if uh, it makes a point uh, to identify how the music is made uh, if when the persons are hearing the, the music. If you are uh, hearing a music, uh, complete analog format mm. music, or made, or you are make you are hearing a complete box made music, complete, uh, completely recorded tape, tape music. I think you'll find that it's mostly people who look like you and me yeah. are the ones who care about that, and most people don't, don't. and we are not in the majority. Um, and, and I think that's but right. It makes, makes a point to, uh, to create, uh, 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 how I can say, Log or, or something that can can uh, identify that tho those kinds of of uh, ways of making music maybe could make some sense in, in the market. What do you mean? Do you mean like a, a, uh, a label or a that says this music was uh, was recorded in a particular way? In the tape, tape recorded or analog made. Yeah, I, and to like people like brand, you and me, brand, that'll be interesting. I, I don't think that it's like a fair trade sticker on bananas. I don't think most people will make a purchasing decision based on... Because they'll make a purchasing decision based on whether they like Rihanna or, or Beyonce, you know? Yeah, but if they start to, to identify uh, the, the, the type mm -hmm. of, of hearing or, or the kind of sound yeah. that you hear, from one style and the kind of sound that you hear from another style, maybe it's like uh, you when you start to 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 know how to eat Chinese food or uh, American food, you can start to to identify some flavors from each culture. Yeah, I, I think there there is something in what you're saying that is People is really good. That which is, I think the, the interesting thing in what you're saying is when you go deep into something, you find things to appreciate. Yeah. Okay. But what I want to steer away from is the idea that there are right and wrong ways to enjoy music or food or, or you know, films or... I, you do you. You, you, you know, like if you want to pour uh, Coca-Cola into your expensive whiskey, knock yourself out. Um, I happen to really like some expensive whiskies, and I'm not going to do that. I like living in a place that is very quiet. Um, I live, you know, in the middle of a forest, miles from most people, um, and I think that's the same thing. I've got this backdrop of nothing behind the music that I like to listen to, whereas most people live in cities with the windows open and traffic and sirens and, and all the rest of it, and it makes no difference whether it was analog recording or digital recording or in somebody's bedroom or, you know, they like the music that they like, and if they want to, but I think it's a niche activity for most of these things. Not everybody who cooks is going to be a chef. Because uh, there are pro products that emerge mm. when, when you implement it in the market and you force it to, to be in the market, yeah. then uh, uh, persons will learn that, that flavor, will, will, will learn uh, that, yeah, that but, but what you're saying, the extension of what you're saying is it's important to you that they know that it was a 12-string lute rather than a you know 12-string guitar or that it was a, you know, and I, honestly, I think most people that's not going to matter a great deal. But the, the, on the flip side, I think pretty much every recording artist, pretty much every recording engineer, pretty much every mix engineer, pretty much every mastering engineer cares about what that record sounds like and will make it sound as good as they possibly can 
for that music and for that audience. And the tools that they use will be the tools that they use. Um, and I don't think that analog tools are better or worse than digital tools. Um, and they'll be aesthetic choices. Um, so, sorry, you were going to say? Yeah, uh, at the end of the day, um, the listeners don't know the difference. And that's not a moral Most judgment either. We know, we know because we are in the field. They don't care if it was analog, if it's hybrid, if it's in all in the box, it doesn't matter. Or if it's AI rather than yeah. human. Yeah, if they connect to that's the music. Where the brand, <laughs> that's where the brand would be important to, te to teach to that, those but persons. Why is it important to teach them? To teach them, them yeah. It's all about the music. It's, it's not why, about why, uh, if it's done uh, through hardware, hardware or software. It doesn't matter, it's music. My, I think my, uh, the basis of my question, or it wasn't actually a question, it was just a discussion point, but uh, that how you consume uh, can, like I feel, I feel that the whole swiping thing, I wish it dies. <laughs> 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 because it's leading to, it's leading to s very low attention spans for people and also like, they don't know what to focus on anymore. Or is this even like, I don't even know uh, how I'm seeing what I'm seeing on my wall, but it's completely random. Mm. And it's, I, it's, again, it's a little disconnected from all this thing, but I yeah. think it kind of leads to... No, it is one of the, the panics that come up about technology. Technology is making us X, Y, and Z. And, and you know, like you say, you, you use Instagram in a particular way. I don't happen to use Instagram a great deal. Um, I will pause on a photo or two, but I'm, I'm a words guy. I would rather sit and read something. I like blog posts, so, you know. So, so it's not, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, yes, the, the scrolling it is basically slot machines, right? It's, it's, it's rewarding the same dopamine thing that, that likes and, and uh, shares and, you know, the next, 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 next. And yeah, I don't think that's necessarily a, a great thing, but I, I think the idea that it's the technology that makes us do that rather than the implementation of it or the, you know, that it's, I mean, it's a long and complicated conversation, but I don't think people are wrong to have shorter attention spans. I don't think it's necessarily a bad thing for people to be able to process an awful lot of information in a short period of time. I don't think people should have to stare at my photo for three minutes before they understand it. <laughs> yeah. I, I have a four-year-old nephew, and uh, he dominates the iPad since he was this size. Yeah. And um, he goes on YouTube and he chooses what he wants to see, and he he sees like ten seconds of a stupid video, and he's, ah, I'm sick of this. <laughs> I'm going to this one. Exactly, yeah. But and I was really terrified. This like this kid is going to be an idiot. The kid is brilliant. Yeah. yeah. He, he's, he's on there. He's on on the iPad for 10 minutes, and then the battery dies. It doesn't make a scene, it just goes, okay, and we'll pick up a musical instrument and a book, and we'll have a conversation with everybody. Yeah. And I don't know what to make of that. I, I tell you, th there is, if we step back from this, what you just did is, is a very common phenomenon in, in conversations about technology, which is, uh, I have a child or a nephew or a, you know, uh, a younger person who uses technology in a particular way, and what we can extrapolate from that is this whole understanding of, of, you know, and I think you're right to say, I don't know what that means. This is a smart kid. This kid, you know. But similarly, I have seen, and I don't have a lot to do with small children a lot of the time, but I have seen friends with small children who will put Paw Patrol or, you know, whatever in front of them, and they will be there for hours, like literally glued to something I think, of course, is, you know, an a nonsense. But they will equally have this oh, 10 seconds, 10 seconds, 10 seconds. This, I'm going to watch this fire truck for the next four hours and I'm going to pay it all the attention. This is my new, big, this is my thing now. Um, and I, I think I was like that with music, you know, honestly. I was switching channels on the radio station and went, what is this? B-52s, you know, and I would listen to that and I'd put that on again. I've got to wait for them to come around and, you know, this is how I worked out how radio stations have rotations, uh, you know, have, have, uh, have you know, music rotates, because I knew if they played it now, they're going to play it again later, and it's, these songs are going to come in between, that's coming back. 
Uh, and I had an attention span for that and no attention span for other things. And I, I think this is, you know, yes, it's a thing, but I don't know if it's a thing. Sorry, going back from the attention spans back to the <laughs> last discussion, because there's something I, I wanted to share, is that I was a DJ for nearly 20 years, and uh, I started with vinyl. I saw the first first time I saw someone play vinyl, I said, man, I really want to do that. Like, that that look, looks amazing. And I, and I did it for a long time until we started to get digital music and digital platforms for DJs to DJ. And it still didn't convince me. At the beginning, I like to touch the plastic, and that's uh, my physical uh, um, relationship with, uh, with um, the instrument. But at some point, uh, they came up with uh, time-coded vinyls where I could touch the plastic and not have to carry uh, mm -hmm. 50 kilos of vinyl every day, not have, yeah, to spend, yeah, not have to spend 100 or $200 a week in uh, euros a week in, uh, in records. Mm -hmm. And it worked fine for me. Uh, I still prefer, if I'm going to listen to a song, I still prefer to sit in, the, in that couch you were talking about with yeah. the two speakers and just put the, the needle and hear how it crackles. And I prefer to listen to it like that. I, uh, lots of times I don't because I'm too busy, uh, so I just uh, do it some other way, mm. which also works in, that, in those moments. And also, at some point, I started buying vinyl again for DJing like two years ago. Because wh when I travel, First, I, I start to feel disconnected from my instrument or from my medium because all those tracks, all those digital tracks in my, in my hard drive at some point uh, stopped meaning uh, stuff to me. So I wanted to get back uh, this connection back to the records. Mm. And also wh whenever I go traveling, the first thing I do is find a record store because this is what informs me about the city where I am. That's how I learned to travel. Mm. So also, uh, so I think it's the same thing I think first uh, I think there are, is that there are people for everything, moments for everything. But it's also to understand who are your audience is in terms of creation. Like, if you are uh, making products for vegans or for people who only uh, eat uh, organic food, put to the label of that this is organic food, and probably a lot of people will will be able to tell the difference. Mm -hmm. uh, some other will not. Some other just don't care. Uh, but if you are proud of it, for example, I saw this. I was listening to this uh, interview to s to to a um, uh, rapper and music producer. He said, I wanted to put on my record that I did everything, that I did the songwriting, I produced, um, I mixed, I mastered. And this for me is important because I want people to know that this was uh, all my work, mm -hmm. uh, not because I'm, uh, you know, I want to show off, but because it was hard work and I, uh, I want people to do it. So I think, um, it's that, like, is it important for your audience to uh, to have this information? Like, is something that makes you proud or that uh, is some information that you want to transmit? Put it in there. Mm. Why not? But uh, it's something that, for sure, will not work for uh, everyone. It will work for specific kinds of audiences that are interested in this specific information that, uh, but yeah, again, like, not everything is for, nothing is for everyone. No? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, I'm, I'm aware that we're sort of over time, um, and, uh, but the fact that you raised Serato uh, is an interesting thing that I think maybe is an interesting one to close on. Um, is Serato is the you know uh, time code vinyl where you could scratch and DJ with digital files using a physical interface. I I love it. I really like it. Um, uh, but Serato recently have come up with an AI generated, well AI driven platform called Stems. And what it enables you to do is you basically put in any kind of music to it and it will extract, extract out, this is the vocals, these are the drums, here's the bass, here's the melody. And you can mix not just between songs, but between the drums of that song and the vocals of that song, or the melody of the song and the bass line of that song. And uh, absolutely, it's like very, I want to say rudimentary because it is just Stems, it isn't like the, the original multi-tracks. Um, but, uh, but this is a technology that was actually developed for Peter Jackson for the Beatles documentary because he wanted to remaster those things or remix those things um, in a way that you know, enhanced the music and, and created new versions of the songs. And you needed to separate out the drums from the bass, from the guitar, from the vocals, which you can do with the Beatles because there was a drummer and a bass player and a you know, guitarist and a, a vocalist. 
Um, whereas with a lot of contemporary music, that's, um, you know, there's a lot of other things going on, but it's really good, this AI at separating out the vocal and separating out the drums and separating, it, you know, it's phenomenal. And that's a creative tool that enables DJs to become more involved with the process of creation of music and, and actually takes the next step beyond what the artist originally put down. There's a whole other conversation to be had with the, what does that mean? Uh, it's called Stems. It's by Serato. I don't. Yeah. Can I suggest that, because there are going to be links and further conversation with the rest of it, this Google Drive that I stuck this one document in, can we open up for everybody to put more things into and use as a resource? So let me actually put my contact details in here. I don't want to show things. I, I'm going to share this document um, with uh, with everybody, and I can. I mean, it was there just to show you the the QR codes, but I can put more stuff in there. Um, yeah. Great. Yeah. Cool. But but please, if you've got more links of interesting stuff that um, follow on for the, yeah. Um, Hugo's in charge of, of sharing the, the Google Drive. <laughs> yeah, we're good. Excellent. Cool. Um, thank you for your patience, everyone. This has been a long day where I've talked a lot, um, and this now I feel like I don't need to anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but we've got more tonight, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'll, I'll let Terry do the talking. <laughs> Believe that when I see it. Um, but thank you, everyone. That's been really cool. Thank and you. actually, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. And I, my, like I said, my objective was to learn more from you than you learned from me, and I did. Um, I think I feel like I, I think I was successful at being the stupidest person in the room. Yeah, <laughs> which was my ambition. Thanks very much, everyone. Cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you.